else? Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, November 14th uh, meeting of the North Andover School Committee. Our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, so please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, as a reminder, could everyone please silence their, um, their phone? For the meeting, please. I'd appreciate that. Uh, first order of business is public comment. Anyone from the public would like to say anything? Big audience tonight, but they're all they're already, already got assigned spots in the agenda. Uh, <laughs> our next order of business is uh, consent agenda, approval of minutes. We have in the packet uh, minutes from November seventh, our last meeting. Any um, motion to? Second. Uh, motion by Ms. McDevitt, second by Ms. Mabley. Uh, further discussion, any changes? What, one small thing, um, and I'm guessing it's for the um, auto correct, which is Mika is the only one that changed to Mika. So I think oh. you want to change it back to Mika. <laughs> M I K A. Yes. It's in under, where you under student report, so. Okay. I think we can, uh, we can accept the minutes for that slight, uh, yes. that slight change. <laughs> our, our apologies. <laughs> Actually, when I typed it in, it auto-corrected to Mike, so <laughs> I'm it? sure that's what <laughs> happened. Okay, any further changes? Any other names called on? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no, the aye. Oh, you're going to abstain? That's right, you were not, you were, you were not present. Yes. Okay. All right, so that vote was 401 with uh, Ms. Lynch abstaining. Okay, uh, student report. Eamon, Mike, I mean. <laughs> 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 I just auto-corrected myself, sorry. <laughs> So thankfully the boys football team won 21 to 18 against uh, Reading in Reading. So they'll be playing this Friday against Lincoln Sudbury, sadly in Lincoln Sudbury. So we won't be able to get out there to support them. But if they win, they will go on to the Super Bowl at Gillette. So fingers crossed. The girls soccer team had a disappointing one to three loss against Westford Academy at home. Sorry, Mrs. Mabley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And the boys soccer team was at home. They also had a one to three loss against Concord Carlisle. Um, in addition, as we teased last week, Wrestle Olympics is next Friday, the 22nd, and it's meant to generate money for the uh, special needs, uh, what's the other one called? The be for Best Buddies, thank you. It's meant to generate money for Best Buddies and to show school support for special needs organizations. Uh, in addition, we canceled tomorrow's coffee house because of the football game so that'll be rescheduled to sometime in mid-december i believe the winter sports uh team preseason meetings have all begun uh, i believe this week and next week are when most teams are having their meetings and that points to the fact that winter is coming soon and most sports start <laughs> most sports will be beginning december 2nd which is the first day of the new trimester the Race Amity Club is attending the Race Amity Conference next Friday, which is a conference meant to facilitate discussion around how to approach conversations regarding race relations and just general community involvement and understanding each other's differences. So there's a handful of people, including myself, and are you attending? And Miss Marks, who will be going into Boston next Friday for that. Uh, lastly, for me, anyways, last Friday, uh, Mika and I both had the pleasure of attending uh, the North End of High School Shorts Fest, which is five one-act plays, each student directed, and it was a fantastic show. I know that on opening night, they made almost $1,000 just in ticket sales, so hopefully the rest of the weekend went well for them. And auditions for Footloose, the musical, have begun, and those will be, it will be premiering February 5th, 6th, 7th, I believe, so buy your tickets now. <laughs> girls flag football tournament between all the grades so that'll be coming up on Sunday November 24th student council is having their annual Thanksgiving food drive where students can come donate canned food to help the Lazarus house if I'm correct 
And with that, finals are coming up the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before Thanksgiving is when the high school is having all their finals. And with that, there will also be a pep rally on the after the last final on Wednesday afternoon. Environmental and Student Council co combined clubs this afternoon to have a little campus cleanup around the school, which they do annually. And it is in in an attempt to have clubs collaborate with each other more often at the high school and creating more unity within the whole school. And is that all we That's have? That's all we have for you. We really need to up tonight. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, any questions for the members? No. Say good luck on the exam. We won't see you until after the exam. All right. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, um, moving quickly to our superintendent's report, uh, Dr. Gilligan. Well, speaking of the weather, it's supposed to be 50 tomorrow. Better? But, uh, I was slightly nervous that on the news that the polar vortex and Arctic blast about uh, scores of times over the last couple of days for one cold day. Uh, I'm glad it worked out. Uh, secondly, uh, we got two things on the agenda, but I wanted to mention. Um, this past Sunday, I had the opportunity to go to uh, the north end of the Historical Society's new acquisition of the Caroline Stevens Rogers Building. Uh, and as many of you may know, that was known as the old printing museum. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as a school district, I'm thrilled that uh, they're renovating that entire space to create an experiential, uh, ex you know, an experiential common space for the community to celebrate our rich history here in North Andover, and more importantly. They, have, they will have space for lectures, they'll have space for per some performances. It's 18,000 square feet. My understanding is that they've raised over two thirds of the money for the renovation. Um, and okay. it's probably one of the few places that's in walking distance from all the schools and maybe even, uh, Miss Leahy, maybe even from the sergeant. <laughs> so, um, you know, from a school's perspective, we're very supportive. It was a great open house. Uh, I was really appreciative of the Historical Society president to uh, extend an invite to me, and I really enjoyed it. So that's that piece. Um, and now, uh, Ms. Marks, any reads? So this is for the 9th grade. They are now claiming the event is going to be um, Don Mullen, who is an Irish journalist um, and a humanitarian, who will be here on next Tuesday, November 19th. At 1 o'clock, he'll be presenting at the high school to students there and then he will be here at seven in the evening. So um, he will talk a little bit about the Christmas truce, which is something that um, we've introduced to the students through this whole NA Reads process. Um, and he will also talk about um, some of the humanitarian work he's doing, including trying to get a UNESCO site where the Christmas truce took place. So one of the things that I learned that I didn't know before was that Hitler was actually there where the Christmas truce took place and not everybody agreed to participate and he was one person who did not agree to participate. So I think he'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I read that in one of the books. I don't know a lot more about it than that, but um, it should be really good. And we've had some great events. Um, we've had some um, a lot of student involvement. Our specialist teachers, um, especially at the elementary and middle school, have been really involved, our librarians. Um, Anyone who's been to the library, if you didn't see the Poppy exhibit, we had kids from um, Thompson and Kittredge march in the parade. Um, you were there. You were there, to all of you, so you saw that. And um, sing at the library. We had middle school kids carry our um, In Their Footsteps banner, which was really nice. Um, and they all stayed for the, the ceremony at Patriots Park. And um, we're hoping next year to have more students actually involved, even though it won't be in any reads event, um, more kids involved in the whole Veterans Day piece. So we work with Veterans Administration and the gentleman who does the parade, and um, we've been in contact again this week. So it was great. So I hope a lot of people can show up to um, hear Don Mullen speak. I think it'll be very interesting. Back to Miss Marks and uh, Miss Andrew to introduce the principals. I'd like to thank the principals for coming out tonight uh, to talk about the MCAS and the results. I know that we had a district overview um, a couple weeks back, and that, um, as you m may recall, we made significant progress this past year. Um, and although there are no longer any more levels, the level one, two, three is what you've been used to, uh, the progress was really remarkable. Also, just a reminder that the high school. Uh, took a completely separate test um, from the legacy text test uh, to the next generation test and that comparison 
um, may be very difficult, um, you know, to follow, but they'll explain it tonight uh, in terms of what that may mean. They, we talked about it a little bit as a district overview, and before I give away all the juicy details that the principals are probably going to say, because I love talking about this, um, I'll turn it over to Ms. Marks to introduce the crew. Okay. Um, Dr. Gillian said mostly the things that I was going to say, so <laughs> I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor anything here. Um, and we're, we are going to huh? start with a high school, so I'm going to invite um, Kristen Nander to come up. She is our MCAS guru, as I said before at this meeting, so she's here to support principals as well. And we're going to start with the high school. So if Chet would like to come on up, I know it's uh, all the principals in the place. So don't uh, put one back in reserve and walk in there. They're all present and accounted well, yeah. for. Just to add on a couple things that felt like even high school students are pointing. Cheerleading team has the North Regional for the Sunday 1140 warm up if anyone wants to come by um, uh, as well. So they're still alive and, and cooking uh, there too. And Jack sent his regards. He's looking forward to the Sunday 2010 and 10 tonight at the high school. So he is uh, talking up a storm and promoting the high school. <laughs> the rest of the We're very proud of Jack as well. So I just wanted to get that in before we started. Um, uh, and also, as we kind of work with our central office team as principals, uh, it's great to work with Maureen, Kristen, and Kara. Uh, they're a great team, and going through a lot of this data, which can, as you know, are probably overload at times, uh, they do a great job in help supporting us as principals and kind of getting through and getting us a starting point where we can go back with our team. So I just want to say that with everyone here. Thank you for all your help there. Um, all right, our first slide uh, shows a little dip in accountability percentile. Uh, as Dr. Gilligan mentioned uh, in the opening, it was our first year with the Next Generation exam. Um, our accountability percentile uh, comes from that average scaled score where the schools are ranked 1 through 99. Uh, so we are at 58, uh, still better than 57% of the other schools in the Commonwealth. Um, I do want to add with this one as well, uh, we did um, go up in uh, our targets, um, just so I can read my own notes here. Uh, even though the accountability percentile is lower, we actually met more targets than last year. I don't think we necessarily got to those targets. Uh, to the level to where we showed that increase, uh, but on that one, uh, we're working toward it. Um, our next slide uh, talks about those meeting targets overall. Um, in 2018, we met 40% of those. Uh, proud to report and going back uh, in, in some work doing within our, our department, uh, focusing on that bottom 25% or the lower 25%. Uh, we were able to get that number up uh, to meeting 57% of the targets. So. Um, you can kind of see that measure from the previous year to now, uh, we were able to make some growth there. Uh, and again, I think having some data back that first year and that next generation uh, test, being able to sit in with some of the uh, meetings with, uh, the, especially the math and ELA departments with Kara and Kristen, um, actually going through, having, being able to go through those different test items and seeing them. I've already seen our departments get, get hard to work at uh, uh, identifying some areas to focus on. So. I think we're a year better at that, getting that data too, which is going to be helpful moving forward. All right, uh, our next slide, um, uh, slide compares uh, North Andover High School again, 2018 to 2019, uh, we can see an increase in targets met for all students uh, as well as the lowest 25%. Um, you know, in all students, we met 55% in 2018 uh, and then went up to 65% uh, in 2019. So uh, again, I think as a whole school, we're making some growth. Uh, there are some areas that I'll talk about in trends later where we're focusing on. Uh, but as a whole, it's nice to see our total numbers uh, increase. Can I ask a question? Yeah, um, sure. Since people are watching something like this for the first time, <coughs> can you or can Ms. Ando um, explain the lowest 25% and why that's an important um, measure, like who that is? and? Like every school has, you know what I mean? Like some people don't know that, and so they wouldn't know what we're talking yeah, about we all evening. Yeah, getting that specific data probably uh, <laughs> later on yeah. in the year, too. Yeah. So the lowest 25%, so every school in the Commonwealth has the lowest 25%. Uh, lowest 25% of students have to include students that have been attending school in at North Andover High or any school for two years. They have to be part of the October 1 SIMS data for freshman year and sophomore year, or if it's an elementary school, at least two years. They cannot include students who are first or second year ELL students either. And so it's a very specific group of students who are had the lowest 25% as, as their averaged ELA in math scaled score. 
and so that so it's a way and the way that 20 lowest 25 percent group is weighted 50 percent in our accountability data so so I have a follow-up question on that mm -hmm. as far as the high school is concerned because you're testing freshmen so they haven't been there for two years so who's the lowest 25 percent then does that it does it go back to the middle school and who was in district or no no it would be someone who attended in ninth grade and tenth grade so the so, so the, the only in math took in ninth grade okay mm -hmm. oh, so it doesn't yeah. include science mm -hmm. Current sophomores and juniors, yep. Yeah. Okay, and they would thanks. Mm -hmm. No problem. And then the lowest 25% is the average of the ELA and the math score, not the science score if they haven't been sitting for two years at the high school. Okay. Any questions? One more before we leave. Sure. As far as the target score comes in, I'm just curious, and we see this throughout, and I can understand why with elementary, but why do we compare the high school to the district? I don't see, I, I'm curious what the value is of that. So the district is the entire, so all you know, students are in a test right. um, together compared to, um, I don't know, I feel like you asked for this information last right. year. I, <laughs> think <laughs> it's, I, no, I think we've been getting it for years. I don't know, I, I don't see it. I'm not sure. It seems to me like they're, you're comparing, you know, completely different populations. Even though they're, they're North Andover students, the high school, Curriculum is very different from elementary. I can see comparing, uh, not even completely see comparing to elementary schools because you've got population differences and things like that. So I'm, I mean, I, I like the one on the right. I just don't un don't understand what I should be getting from the one on the left, if anything. It could be the way a way to measure about how our students do over time when they've been with us. Like how are our third, fourth, and fifth graders at said elementary school doing compared to our middle school students compared to our okay. high school students as they evolve over a student. It's not the same student, so you can't, right. you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's a, why I was it's curious. Not, it's a correlation rather than a causation, okay. however you want to say that. But the idea that like we could prepare, like how is our three to five group doing compared to our six to eight group doing, you know, compared to our 10th grade group, like if they're, so the district, av it, it's not an average, the district is everybody, right. like meeting targets or not, including subgroups that might be too small to be noted at any particular school. If there's less than 20 students in a subgroup mm -hmm. at a school, we don't always necessarily note them in the full data. So if you have the entire district data, that's a bigger picture. They would be in that data. Then. They would be. Everybody's in that data. So the year past, the middle school and the high school, before we switched over to this new test, they would have uh, high school and district would be the same exact number, and the state would generate a report that, right. you know, it, it was the same thing because it was the one test. I think um, ultimately one just thing to kind of remember because this is so different is remember the change in elementary and middle school was two years ago and that was the year that they said Massachusetts is number one in the nation in terms of testing but half of the kids in all of the Commonwealth, half, were not meeting expectations. So what used to be the advanced and meeting expectations kind of all bumped down a group. You know, so when they were saying earlier, for example, I think it was um, – you know, how many were exceeding, and I think it was, what, 72, whatever the slide had. J just so people know at home, compared to the old test in 2018, ELA 96% were proficient or higher. Math was 89 and science 90. So that, that's a significant change, and it, it's pretty common across all high schools have seen that same change. So just if anyone was alarmed, they saw this huge shift. You know, this test is now being judged the same as the pre-48. <laughs> uh, yeah, so our next slide talks about students' progress toward meeting targets. So talked about earlier uh, this year, we 50, 57% of our targets. The previous year, year at 40%. Um, one of the data points that the state now uses is what's that cumulative criterion reference target percentage based on a 40, 60% weight from the previous year to the current year. Um, and the formula is there at the bottom, too. And I, I think I copied this from George's last slide. Uh, you did a nice job on that, too, just to kind of <laughs> give me the cheat sheet and explaining it. Uh, but because ours comes out to 50%. Oh, we're a team. We're a full team back there uh, 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 toward meeting targets. So I think one of the good things is seeing growth from 2018 to 2019 and also knowing the following year, if we have a considerable growth meeting targets, it's going to significantly raise um, that 50% cumulative criterion reference point for this year because we'll be ditching the 40% and replacing it with a 57. So, um, but it's always nice to see growth. Um, one of the questions that uh, I know I was asked to come back with on this time was information on the educational proficiency plans uh, that historically were used uh, when kids met the minimum 
passing criteria, but didn't, didn't quite get to proficient. So it was the old needs improvement in between needs improvement to proficient. Uh, so the students that just, they fulfilled their graduation requirement, but weren't quite proficient. Uh, so our guidance department oversees uh, that information. Um, we put that necessary, informa necessary information in the power of schools so our teachers have it. Um, I showed the data on the left and the right. Uh, the class of 2020 is our senior class. They took the old legacy exam. Uh, the class of 2021 is our current junior class that took last year's next generation exam. Uh, so you have the numbers there uh, and can see where our kids, amount of kids that scored um, 240 or higher in our old test, um, which is equivalent to now 472 or higher in ELA. Not to give you guys a popsicle headache, uh, we have a lot of kids being successful uh, at North Ann River High School. Um, the amount of kids we actually have on, on plans is small uh, when you're testing over 300 kids. Um, you know, we've had more in math uh, than in ELA, um, exam to exam, uh, but um, you know, those are the numbers there. Uh, our teachers give extra focus. Again, those students have met their minim minimum graduation requirement. Um, our coursework as it moves through, uh, especially for ELA, science and math in those areas, uh, significantly goes, uh, uh, it gets tougher as they go along in algebra, uh, in further writing in college or English, in uh, chemistry into uh, a lot of times physiology and anatomy uh, in the other areas. So um, I wanted to share that. Um, trends, uh, so what does it all mean and what are we doing, right? Um, uh, first of all, again, I think it takes a lot to go through, get this data, and have people to work with to meet with our teams at the high school uh, within departments. Um, we're focusing on that lowest 25%. That was the kind of the target last year. Seems to be remaining, the t remains the target uh, from the state uh, and things we want to focus on. Uh, we moved that from 24% to 48% meeting the target. And I think last year, again, we had uh, late information than identifying who those students were in the lowest 25%. So uh, Kristen and Carol work remarkably to try and get us that one, that information, because they're go going from an eighth grade test to the 10th grade test, so um, we wait for that data. Um, our science department, they meet, met all their targets, including students with disabilities uh, and Asians exceeding the targets. Uh, the subgroups did decline in ELA. Um, we worked on some things last year in diversifying curriculum uh, to have mirrors for all students, uh, have text choices that reflect um, uh, areas that students are able to read and can have choice. Um, we have some independent reading now, uh, English department wide, that's getting kids excited about reading and getting them to participate. Uh, those are some of the few things we've done in ELA already. Uh, we have a third trimester of English in for uh, this year uh, that's gonna be targeted for students that had struggled uh, coming from uh, the middle school to the high school. Uh, so we have some things we're excited about to kind of have leading into um, their ninth grade experience that will translate as they move as well. Uh, in the math department, I sat in as uh, Ms. Larcombe uh, met with Ms. Daly in the math department, uh, and, and they're good with going through the numbers and the item analysis uh, as well. Um, I think they did some curriculum reviews to make sure, again, that we're covering everything uh, that all students are getting to prior to the exam. Uh, and they did that as well. I think they're itching to get more time also to review that item analysis um, by item descriptors. I think one of the good things that we're able to do now is we can get different scores by subgroups. So we're gonna have a focus on that economically disadvantaged and Latinx uh, subgroup that have been scoring lower for us. Um, and then are able to kind of get that data, look why they're, where they're scoring lower and then meet as teams within those two subject areas to kind of see where we can focus on. So we started that one on November 5th, I think, that Tuesday. We had our PD, which we used, uh, I thought, very well. So I think one of the things I'm excited about as a principal, it seems when we're able to target things and target areas, we're able to move. We did a little bit with that lowest 25. I think we're excited to get that data, look at those, those areas where we're lower and get them to move as well. So. Um, you know, but I think it doesn't happen without the team to be able to kind of go through and then use that PD time. Uh, a lot of that two hour days we work in departments to kind of look at some of the stuff as well as our goals. Yeah. 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 Was the first class coming into ninth grade with the 
elaborate math new paths, if you will, that started in eighth, eighth grade with like the new graphic that you show. Yeah, we came up with the right, graphic. That, that yes, the, yeah, yeah. The, first, the, the current <laughs> seniors are the first group to have that. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I'm curious, will you all have a chance to, or does, is that impactful at all, to look at the changes you made four years ago and, and track, is, is, are you going in the right direction? Do you need to do further tweaking? Has that been successful? And then my corollary is, mm -hmm. Would you, are you doing a similar type of thing in ELA? So like you said, when they come in, are they getting enough in middle school so when they hit ninth grade, they're prepared to write at the right level and things like that? Yeah, no, great question. I think we're always reviewing that one when we look at the data. I think for math specifically, uh, what we did on Tuesday was kind of look through to say, hey, based on the data, because we have a new test uh, that has different item descriptors uh, named and things like that. So we needed to look at the data to say, hey, is there a, a big negative toward a state average in an area that we're, we're doing poor, more poor in, and does that stand out, and are we, you know, are we hitting it in our curriculum? We did that, and we are. So I think part of that one is, uh, yes, I think in English I talked about some things that l took after maybe my presentation last year and throughout the summer and into this year, we've been looking to make some adjustments uh, on the writing and getting kids, at all students, access to things. So some of these things come with, um, uh, I think, a payoff maybe with MCAS to show that one-time test at light. But a lot of them are we're using to really enhance the kids' engagement in all our courses. Um, so you know we want to do both. Um, so I think, yeah, we, we kind of do that on the math end of it. We're always, you know, do we have kids in their proper slots? Are we pushing them? Is there rigor um, across all classes? Um, and are we transitioning kids from middle to high school? And really that eighth and ninth grade, that's that, that step where we don't know them and what can we do there? And I think that's a lot of the time and work where we're gonna focus at too is how do we transition our kids, all kids to, to have that success early on. So I hope I answered it. Um, yeah, I have two yeah. things, Mr. Yeah. Jackson. Um, first, thank you very much. Um, my first question is, um, you know, there's always a lot of talk about the trimester schedule. Yeah. Um, and some people are fans, some people yep. are, don't even realize probably that they have trimesters. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've heard a lot, you know, over the years about, uh, I think from a lot of parents that my child might have uh, math, for example, you know, one trimester, and then they may go, you know, one entire one without it, or, or and then, you know, the summer comes, and then, you know, so they can go, you know, a significant amount of time with math, are we doing anything to kind of better stagger um, some of those classes to make sure that we are um, trying to keep it consistent, right? Because I think if we take math, for example, trimester one and trimester two, and then we're taking the test, you know, um, and, and we're not getting math available to them in, mm -hmm. in the third trimester, it may not be as fresh. Yeah. Uh, you know, you understand what I'm asking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we're always, we have a team of teachers kind of looking at the schedule through NEASP in general too to open up some different opportunities, so that's ongoing. Um, I think for our sophomores, meet three times a year in all three trimesters in math. Um, I think in freshman year, some of them may have two or three, um, depending on kind of where they come in. So that's where we're kind of focusing on, and we added a course. Um, a couple years ago when we identified kids that were scoring lower to have a Algebra 1 AD class, so they had that third trimester yeah. uh, as well. But I think, yeah, I think we're always looking to do that. I think having that choice in what you do with a break and kind of enhancing that curriculum, we also work on sophomore year when they come in, although the most take geometry mm -hmm. and they're taking Algebra freshman year, how do we do spiral different curriculum things in um, that may have been learned second or first trimester freshman year, but are gonna come back on that exam later on. Um, so I think it's stuff we already worry about even if we had all, th all three trimesters each year, because we have some students that take that too, um, and how we best kind of enhance that short-term memory uh, with students. But I think, yeah, we, we are looking at the schedule because we wanna see if we can offer a better structure to support some other learning opportunities for kids. Uh, and we've enhanced some different courses uh, to give kids additional time as well. So yeah, we're looking at it. So, so one of the things I might um, yeah. kind of put out there, and I don't know the feasibility necessarily of yeah. it, but um, you know, in that off trimester, for example, you've got the alternate day schedule. So maybe there's an opportunity um, for some of them, uh, you know, to have math, you know, in some of those, maybe a boost or you know something like that. I don't, I don't know all of the different kind of. Um, uh, 
like elective ones that are there, but if there's an opportunity for some of those for some of the students who might need that extra help and encouragement, um, that that could be an opportunity. Yeah, so no. just, just a thought. No, thank you. No, and I think um, we, we've also tried to get some people to double up uh, in some areas to try and move right. across. I mean, Ms. Mabley talked about that path so they can get to some higher level courses as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I certainly know students who've done that. Um, and then when we look at some of the, comp um, the, the growth that's out there, I mean, 17%, I think, is fantastic. Um, in, uh, I, I don't remember, it was a couple slides back. The target, um, yeah, from 40 to 57 for the of the target targets, that's yeah. Out there. Um, and I'm not necessarily hopeful that, that we have it, you know, at the ready today, but we always talk a little bit about what our comparisons are, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, if we're looking at our accountability percentile for last year to this year, and we, we certainly dropped in, so we know where some of that is, but I'd mm -hmm. be curious to see from our comparative, comparative peers, where did they fall? Were they also, you know, trending down? Were they, you know, were they skyrocketing up? You know, w where did we sit with all of that? Um, and Mrs. Anna, you may know that um, off the top. You're, you're <laughs> so, uh, you, you she's good. Your I head. don't know if she's that good. <laughs> I looked at this a hundred times. Like the answer is seven. You know? um, but you know, <laughs> seven point five. Um, but I think that would be a little bit interesting, yeah. right? I mean, like. I think that the growth is great, but if some of the peers that we compare yeah. ourselves to historically are not on the same tra trajectory that we're on, um, I, I'd, I'd be curious about that and maybe we ev visit them. Maybe we, we look at some of their PBs that they're doing and say, what are you doing right? And it's, it's not just about one test, really, um, but I think it is a good benchmark that people use. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. and could have been everybody had a bad day that day. I don't know. Two right, years ago, right? right? Exactly. So. And you know, I do know. I just pulled it up that the the Dart data for the trends. One of the best matched schools to us, according to demographics, is Bridgewater Raynham, which yeah. surprises most people when I tell them that it comes up as like you know economically disadvantaged students with dil disabilities. A lot of those demographics are similar, and so I could either pull for a list of the comparables like that Dr. Gilligan had for our middle school mm -hmm. discussion that we had last week. Yep. Or like there's a DART data where the state pulls the schools that are most similar to ours demographically. So I could do either. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a, just as a reminder that for the district, they have the DART schools that are alike. But then every other school it really varies completely widely. So you may have one school that are more in, uh, more in line with Pittsfield or Cambridge or Saugus or Woburn. And you may have other schools more in line with East Longmeadow um, than some of the other districts. Thank you. Thank We're you. open to looking at, at any of the closest ones, I think. Mm -hmm. Now that you're asking questions, I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if we do any um, across level looking, and I would think that would be you, Ms. Ando, to see if there's any um, clumping or grouping or something that we can identify, especially about like these 40 kids in the ATP category. like. Do they all come from one of the elementary schools? Did they all have a certain, you know, teacher at, at the middle school? Um, so that we can shore up um, some of those earlier grades so that when they get to the high school, they, there's more strengths. Or, I mean, you could look at any, you know, any of those groups. I mean, you could look at the top performing students and see, you know, what they maybe have in common. Maybe they have nothing in common. Mm -hmm. um, but if there were, if we were able to see that um, somewhere back in their career, um, there's some place where we can shore up um, for future mm -hmm. students who are going to be mm -hmm. taking those tests. No, absolutely. I think we've done that work on the curriculum side where like Mr. Jackson talked about uh, an item analysis. So we can look across like every item, literally every item that's given on the test. What is the North Andover average versus the state average? We can look at that by classroom. We can look at that by child. And I think we've looked at like where are our students struggling in 10th grade and is that similar to 8th grade, 6th grade, 4th grade, you know, consecutively. And we've noticed like trends in curriculum areas where we need to shore up. But as far as looking at particular groups of kids, that, w that is something we will start doing when, when our lowest 25% data becomes more and more available. And so because we have lowest 25% for each school, but then there's a collection of the lowest 25% for the entire town and not every child is on both lists, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? And so that would definitely be something for us to target early. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say Jesse has not been timely with that either. 
not at all. <laughs> and then t and Desi blames all of us because we have to enter our October 1st SIMS data. They have to get the October 1st SIMS data from everybody in the state. And they say once everybody has submitted, then they can give us our own 25% list. And so last year we got it December, maybe January. Like, you know what I mean? It, was, it wasn't soon enough. So I'll go into the raw data and just try to make our best guess at who these students are looking at the bottom quadrant and we'll, we'll so that the teachers will have data sooner. It will be so fun. I know. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Well done. Now batting. <laughs> Miss, Miss Marks, is it Mr. Gonsalves? Yes. And I would just say I, I, I'm really pleased with uh, Mr. Gonsalves and Mr. Jackson's. I think it's the most open lines of communication we've had across this transition in years. And I'm really pleased, for example, you know, they, they made some significant changes in math at the middle school a few years ago, and that's something that they're taking into consideration and you know, trying to really uh, open that up to them and make their pay less. So. Especially when you hear that I'm starting my life with Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great guy, and we're partnering well together. I actually texted him to say, hey, I want to sit up there with you <laughs> when you do your presentation. And then you invited Kristen up, and I'm thinking, oh, three's a crowd. I'll stay <laughs> back there. Um, because they don't need a chaperone up here. <laughs> um, so now it's my turn. I'm proud to talk about NAMS. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Um, funny funny um, accountability percentile up here. So 2018, we were 63rd percentile. 2019, we're 63rd percentile again. Um, yet we've demonstrated some significant growth. When you think about um, wha how students perform, there's four categories um, to how they perform. You have, the, um, you have the categories where they're exceeding, they're meeting, they're partially meeting, and they're not meeting expectations. And even though a child can move up within that category until they cross that threshold and go into the next category, and what we saw at NAMS last year was many students moving up those threat but to the threshold but not just not clearing it to not enough to go to the next so then our accountability percentile stays approximately the same so I'm very excited um, to look at my crystal ball and see what next year will hold so when you look at how what is our progress toward our improvement targets um, I had the same question why are we comparing NAMS to the district I would love to compare NAMS to the state because all of our schools, we do very well compared to the state. Um, but as a district, I can see. So when you look at 2018 for NAMS, that's in blue. Check out what it looks like in red. In one year's time, it went up quite a bit. Now last year, that was the first year that we were administering MCAS 2.0. It was really hard to compare last year's results to the previous year's results. It was a different test. It was apples and oranges. Now we're comparing apples to apples. And our scores as an aggregate, as an overall school population, went up. Largely due, believe it or not, to our lowest 25%. So if you go to the next slide, um, our lowest 25%. By the way, we got that data so late, we didn't really do much with the data. We didn't identify those kids, make them wear t-shirts or hats or carry anything around. Um, I didn't even communicate to the teachers who the lowest 25% were because I'm a believer in unless you have tier two programs in the school where we can schedule kids for those um, additional remedial classes, it's basically good teaching and making sure all students can access the curriculum. And our lowest 25% of the students went up almost fourfold um, in, in regards to their score to the point where they're no longer the lowest 25%. So the lowest 25% this upcoming year will be a whole different batch of kids, all in seventh and eighth grade. Our eighth graders are now in ninth grade. Um, and our lowest 25% is always comprised of seventh and eighth graders. You have to be in the school two consecutive years. Um, and again, you're the lowest 25% based on how you did the year before. So our students overall are doing pretty well. Um, then when you go to that next slide, this is a tough slide without that left side explaining what it means. And, and Chet and I are both equally excited to see what next year's um, cumulative progress toward targets looks like because we're still holding on to that last year's score to the point where it's worth 40%. And this year's 
we went from 26 percent to 54 percent and and 54 percent is only worth 60 percent so now that 54 goes to 40 let's see what this year holds and then we'll see what our our total percentage is and as Kristen explained um, schools are assessed based on how their entire aggregate every single student um, does on MCAS and equal worth is how your lowest 25% students do so your entire school is 50% your lowest 25% is 50% and that's how you get that 43 or that's how you get the 54 that's how you get the 26 and then they average those a little bit and get the 43 so there's a lot of number crunching based on that I think kids probably need every trimester of math just to understand this system <laughs> will be oh. they said that they're going to give the system four years and then revisit it that's what I hear but I don't know how the percentages are going to even out and 50% um, of the state still is not meeting expectations on MCAS 2.0 and yet we're doing better than most of the country when it comes to performance in schools but if it, can you go back more yeah the, just one more question on that though but I mean when you look at the 43 I mean it is so misleading right when we've gone up you know, basically 30 points there, mm -hmm. you know, in, in terms of that growth. I mean, that's where I think, you know, if we can look at, at our cohort, you know, we can really kind of look at mm -hmm. it. But that's fantastic. Um, so when you say the 43 next year is going to be changed, you think it's going to just be a joke? Unless well, something drastic happens. Depends how we happens. do in the test. Hey, right. hey, right. you know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it depends if that 60 percent number goes. But it's mine's as high as the 54. Right? <laughs> but based on the people I work with over at NAMS, um, I have a lot of confidence in what we're going to do. The place is amazing. You you entrusted me with an amazing team to work with. Uh, oh my goodness, it's it's awesome. Um, and then and then looking at trends. So again, you saw the overall progress. Um, uh, we you saw how students performed. Our lowest twenty five increased dramatically from fourteen percent of the targets to hitting sixty five percent of the targets. Um, I, it is worth mentioning that the average SGP for all grades, all subjects, is within 44 to 66.9%, took the lowest average and put the highest average. Um, normal growth from year to year, your SGP is between 40 and 60. Below 40, you're falling behind the pack that you were placed with. And, and how were students put in this pack? It's based on two consecutive years of MCAS scores. So, um, you, you know, I score a, a 500 this year, last year, I score a 500, or two years ago I score a 500, last year I score a 500. Every kid my age in the state that had similar scores, we're all lumped together. And for math sake, let's say there's only 100 of us, even though there's like over 1,000, but there's 100 of us. This year, on last, next year on MCAS, I get an SGP of 50. That means that I did better than 49% of the kids in my cohort, and 49% uh, did better than me. So that's why my SGP is a 50. So anywhere between 40 and 60, you're running with the pack. Anything above that, you really out outpaced your pack. Anything below that, you, you, you're not running with the pack. And now you're putting a different pack every year. So we like to see that, and we like to see the high growth as much as possible. Um, it's worth mentioning we're consistently above the state average in regards to achievement. Um, I think there's only, th you might know this, I bet you do, there's only 15 districts in the state that spend less per pupil than we do, yet our scores don't show that. We do pretty darn well. And and let's see, to pop up. Um, we did, again, we're looking at, we're looking at trends, Aqu weird trends, ELA, African American, Latinx, and economically disadvantaged students, they declined. I mean, we're looking at 1% decline, 1.5, not anything tremendous, but interesting that that would happen. Not sure why. In ELA, our lowest performing, EL, and students with disabilities, they all met their targets. So um, I know I do want to echo what um, Principal Jackson said. 
the work of Laureen Marx, Kristen Ando, and Kara Larkham is, has been well received at NAMS. Um, one of the areas what we're looking at, thanks to Kristen's efforts, is diversifying what kids are reading and writing about in our English classes. And that makes engagement that much stronger for our students, um, not just reading the works of dead white guys. So I think that helps um, math. All subgroups met or exceeded target. You usually see ELA rise quicker than math, and yet math is really doing well, and we want to continue that. Science, all groups declined. We're comparing apples to oranges, remember. This was the first year of the new science test, I and it had the new curriculum assessed. So um, last year was the first year that eighth graders had gone through the new curriculum in sixth grade, the new curriculum in seventh grade, the new curriculum in eighth grade, and then they were assessed. Nec this upcoming year, our students, those teachers would have taught it two years. And then the year after, those teachers would have taught it three years. So the science curriculum that was all revamped, but our eighth graders last year, um, what they learned was the first time in sixth, the first time in seventh, the first time in eighth. And we're comparing to the previous test, which was completely different. So those scores declining, it's similar to what the high school experienced. It's a brand new test. Comparing this year to next year makes a little more sense. But we have high hopes. We're doing well. We're going to continue to do well. And something I just want to mention to kind of explain that lowest 25% going up uh, last year as a school, the entire uh, teacher population created goals based on standard two of the education evaluation rubric, which is meeting the needs of all learners. It was our focus last year that we were making efforts, being provided PD, working together, no one was an island, sharing best practices to reach all students, and I think it paid off. Now, we wanna continue to increase the rigor so that we're meeting all students, but we're also moving them all forward. We're not just shepherding the sheep that are a little behind, we're allowing the other sheep to go forward faster and get ahead too, so we're, we're moving it all. All right, all right, I hope I was brief, which I never am. <laughs> it would be helpful to me um, to see the data broken out by test at some point. Mm -hmm. um, I know I can go on to the okay. DESE website and, and see that, but you know, when we're just looking in general, we're not learning. I mean, this is great. You pointed out a lot of stuff. There's no way from this I would have known that we declined in science in all areas unless you happen to point it out. And while I appreciate you pointing that out, I, I don't know what I don't know because mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. And I think for us, I think that it, it more importantly is with the trends, we used to have the, if you think about the presentation we've done in the past with the celebrations and then the areas to work on, um, I really like how this is pretty transparent about, you know, um, this is where we did well, but more importantly, this is where we're at with some of these other pieces. And we can certainly get you that data. <laughs> that almost sounds sincere. <laughs> and, I, and you probably simplified this data because at some point we said, we don't need all these <laughs> details, just give us the generality, so. I think there is some information there. I think there is like diving very deeply into the wrong school data, but absolutely. There's a school and district profile that the state puts together that actually simplifies it quite a bit, so I can get you, I can get you there. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I just I'm so glad that you're collaborating. So I think it's the success of the high school is on the back of middle school, just like all the changes in elementary is, is helping you. So um, I encourage you to keep working on that. And so transitions, that. so important. I want to work uh, as well with all the elementary principals as I'm working with chat. I'm the middle child, great peacemaker. I want to yeah. make sure everybody's getting along. Right, no, it's, and, and that's what is going to make a kid successful for sure. So Agreed. thank you. Appreciate thank you. the Everybody collaboration. Jack, part today. Thanks for holding the job. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so now that we've done about half the students in the district and <laughs> we represent the high school and the middle school. For elementary, so we're going to start with Principal O'Loughlin. <laughs> the doctor, Frederick Washington School. Things are not getting conveyed. Wait, wait, oh, wait a minute, excuse me. At all. Wait, that's okay. We're let her, she's, 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 she's due, let, let, her, let her go first. Yes, then we'll go to the we'll go, Thompson. We'll go, we'll go. Oh, I, no, 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 you're, 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 
up here. But I, I, I always flip it off with Chris because he always has like two seconds to talk because uh, he's, he's always the last one. So I said, I said, Greg, just make sure that Chris gets the He was actually thing. glad about that before oh, we came in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's put, let, 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 let's, put, let's put the rookie on the clock right now. Set so. <laughs> the bar really high. Well, Erin is, is her first year at the Atkinson School, and um, there's really exciting news to share there. Oh, the Significant for. progress, and uh, you can move the microphone. You have to move yourself. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here we go. All right, here we go. Um, so, yes, like uh, Dr. Gilligan was saying, I wasn't there last year, but I feel as though I have a lot to um, speak on Atkinson's behalf. They have a lot to celebrate this year. So um, for our accountability percentile, in 2018 it was 33, in 2019 it was um, 39 percent. So um, that means that Atkinson outperformed 38 percent of other public elementary schools in Massachusetts. Um, and then moving to uh, Atkinson's progress towards improvement targets, um, again, in 2018, it was 39 percent of the targets were met, and then in 2019, 87 percent of the targets were met. Um, so, yeah, that was a huge jump. Um, and then at Atkinson, all the students met 81 percent of their targets, and our lowest 25 percent cohort met 93 percent of their targets. Um, so, yeah, again, yeah, it's. Um, there we go. So um, looking at this slide, um, I feel as though um, Principal Jackson, and I always say your name wrong, but Gonzalez, Gon there we go, <laughs> um, there we go. All right, and um, explain this one well, but this is um, something that I felt like with staff, like we really, Kristen helped me to really dive into this. And in 2018, Atkinson met 39% of the growth targets set by um, Desi. And then in 2019, Atkinson met 87%. Um, so again, cumulatively, the 2018 was weighted 40%, 2019 was weighted 60%. Um, so that weighted cumulative uh, score for Atkinson for both years was 68%. Um, again, this shows the school history over time. Okay. Um, so trends. So um, just to give you a little background, um, Kristen and I both met with the staff, and not having been there last year, we talked a little bit about these trends and then talked about what, it, what did you do, because there was huge growth. It, it was awesome to be able to report to them. Um, so looking at our trends, the overall data shows positive growth trends, um, going from 39% to 87% for the aggregate of progress towards the meeting targets, the lowest 25% going from 67% to 93%. Um, other subgroups made substantial progress towards the targets. Um, however, our EL group, we noticed that they had a struggle. So this is um, 23 students. They went from 24% in 2018 uh, down to 5% in 2019. So at this point, we're doing like a lot of the tier three intervention, that intensive individual support. But this is a group that we'll definitely focus on um, this year to see what other um, implementations we can put in to help this group show growth. Um, and then so what Kristen and I did is some PD with the staff and we provided a um, survey to the staff after we had them go around and look at the different sections of where students were scored and we had them put dots of where we thought or where they thought um, students scored for percentages this year. And so pretty much most of the staff we saw put uh, sticker dots near the percentages that were for 2018 and I think they were pretty much shocked, mm -hmm. I think, um, in 2019. It was a lot of clapping, a lot of celebration. <laughs> Um, so at the end of that PD, we gave them a survey. Um, we asked, what did you do to change your instruction? Um, how did you use data differently? And then what else do you feel went well? Um, so here are our results. So consistent curriculum. Uh, there's consistent curriculum and more comfortability, uh, especially with the uh, Eureka Math, the Lucy Parkins Reading, the Lucy Parkins Writing. Um, another thing was they felt more comfortable with that data use, and they really looked at that and dove into that last year, uh, looking at the map, the dibbles, the running records, and this drove like more small group instruction. So again, that's our last one here, um, where teachers felt as though they really took that data, they looked at the students who were in front of them, and they did a lot more small group instruction last year. So again, we're working on those three areas again this year. Um, haven't been new, I felt like that was something that was pretty consistent with all teachers in, in an area where we're going to just continue to work on that. So. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
Oh, come on. The shoe's not that big. <laughs> That's what somebody said to, to me today. What do we do if we don't? We'll, I'm like, we'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where are we going? Jesus, you have him that has, you've had a great interest in the Nova CL students at Atkinson in the last two years? It's, it's been a lot of time. Pretty steady? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not suddenly you're trying to teach 70 kids and so it's caused, okay. Yeah. What are we saying about that? So um, we've got lots of ideas. Some of those I will be talking to Dr. Gilligan about next week when he and I meet. Um, but it's something that we're looking at because we feel the need to change some things that are, sure. that are happening for those students. Mm -hmm. The other thing I just want to comment on, um, when Kristen came back and shared the survey results, I was thrilled because this is something we're really working on in terms of PD and with our curriculum. Um, when when Erin is talking about small group instruction, she's not talking about um, like what um, – George was referring to like pulling out for tier two. This is actually instruction that's happening in the classroom. So really using formative assessment, in the minute assessment, to look at what students' needs are and then pulling small groups during that independent work and practice time to reinforce those skills, which is really, that's been our, our goal and it's, it's really great to see that happening. And we know it works, but to see that yeah. is really, it's wonderful. No, it doesn't. Good question. That's only yeah. the lowest 25%. So EL, it's actually EL and formerly EL. So if a child mm -hmm. has ever been labeled as an English learner in their career. And so generally, it takes three to four years before a student will score high enough on the access testing in order to be exited from the EL program. But it's both. But no, those students wouldn't be, if they're first or second year EL, they wouldn't be counted in the lowest 25%. But everybody is in the subgroup. Mm -hmm. out by the time they get to middle school that's where you see the numbers drop off yeah. but we also have the move-ins I would say the important thing about Atkinson is I've been to almost every class this year and I'd say when I've asked we probably have four or five new students new to the school in almost every classroom mm -hmm. uh, so there was you know there's a churn rate in terms of social mm -hmm. in, in terms of um, uh, you know, mobility sure. rate. right in order to be counted in the EL subgroup though they would have had to have been sitting at the Atkinson school October 1st of that year if they had moved in in January, they would we belong to somebody else's accountability. Mm -hmm. And I want to comment. I absolutely love your survey that you did. Um, and obviously, those of us or um, all of the people who are involved in supporting new curriculum are happy to see that the teachers are happy with that and, and feel like it's making a difference. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. nice to uh, see that. I appreciate that. That's terrific. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Fantastic. And, and obviously, great progress. Um, it's more a question for Dr. Gilligan. Am I right that? I feel like two years ago we had an impact on our Title I um, resources at Atkinson. Yeah, so I, not just Atkinson. So <coughs> the two Title I schools, we had the middle school included, and they got a very small, modest amount of money. Um, but <coughs> nothing to do with our school population. Right. It's the federal census in D.C., which I've called and tried to argue about because we were off one year by, you know, it was like 4.8%. You have to hit the 5% threshold. Uh, otherwise, you lose uh, a portion of it. And uh, not this past year, but the year before, I believe it was about $209,000 that was slashed. And we get this information in the summertime. And then a few years prior, when it was slashed one time, it was $183,000. And when you're talking about a uh, Title I budget of, uh, what is it now, 400000 350000 <coughs> On a good year. It, it, it was completely significant. Um, but uh, I do appreciate the teacher's hard work, particularly Eureka Math, if you recall. Yeah. In a lot of districts, I mean, it's very teacher intensive that first year. But as you'll see tonight, like in the second year, what we saw in Groton Dunstable and North Reading and Methuen and some of the other places that adopted it, um, the scores went really high. So yeah. exciting. Before you go, <laughs> um, <laughs> What resources do you feel like you need for EL at Atkinson and, and perhaps across the district? Because in a little while we're going to be having a discussion about budget directives. Yeah. So it, it will help us to know what resources will be helpful to you to address that EL group. I think, 
I think that's hard to put on a <laughs> hard to put on a first year principal who oh. just took over. But what I would Whoever say, wants to answer. So this is the plan. I mean, in the strategic plan, EL has been a significant thing that we've wanted to look at. Uh, North Andover's had a model uh, for it started out with tutors, then it you know started out having tutors that were certified right. as teachers. Um, and what I can tell you is, when we come in on December fifth. Uh, to present uh, the updated revised strategic plan. The, the objective's not going to change. All students' professional practice consistent and rigorous curriculum. But an area like EL is an area that we want to make some changes so that we can best support those students, even though they've been doing well in testing out. Uh, it's not just students who receive EL services. It's about education the in the entire population of our teachers for PD around students whose English is not their first language. They may not receive services. It's uh, some of that's the cultural proficiency piece, but more importantly, um, we can't do it all at once. And what you'll see as part of the plan is a plan to say, well, how are we going to look at and make recommendations for a model that's sustainable, doable over a period of time that includes in th different components? And that may include going from the model we have to teachers, um, other than the one teacher that we do have. sides of the same coin where a student who is an EL by the state guidelines may spend between 60 and 90 minutes with an EL certified teacher but the rest of the day they spend with a classroom teacher uh, what I call homeroom teacher a general a general educator and I think we need to do some investing in training and providing opportunities for our teachers who are with the students for 75 percent of the day and at the same time offering them opportunities for small group instruction with someone who's certified in ESL and so um, that's another area from my former life that I have to be advising. <laughs> and so, and that's why we hired Miss Ando and put EL under her. <laughs> right, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, from the private Albert E. Thompson School. <laughs> Is this? It's up to Mr. Raymond. Mr. Raymond, you want, would you? Okay. From the Benjamin Franklin School, uh, Joseph Clark, the principal. I know. I thought I'd share the meeting. That's all right. I think it was a, pl I think it's their own plan by Mr. Raymond. I think it was two, actually. Yeah. Oh, I have to move this up a little bit. Mr. Yeah. Raymond, just to prepare you, we will ask you to go next. <laughs> Sorry, Rich. <laughs> You're getting bumped. We're saving Richard for last. Oh, he's so bright. Yes. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. So we're here to talk about the Franklin School right now. A um, lot to be happy about at the Franklin School. Um, some def definite positives, but a lot of good areas that we can improve upon, too, and areas of growth that we can see in the horizon. Um, if Principal Gonzalez let, lends me his crystal ball, I'll be able to get in there and see how we do. It'll be nice. Um, so if you look at our accountability percentiles, uh, we went from 74 in 2018 up to 77, so we're going in the right direction. We like to see um, that. And if we go on, we can see where some of our growth was. Um, so if we look at our whole school last year, I sat here and we had 58% of our targets met. This year we increased to 68% of our targets met. A lot of that has to do, and Mr. G uh, Dr. Gilligan um, alluded to the math, and I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but um, we really made, made some great strides, and obviously we love to see those numbers going in that direction. So we really took a look at our lowest 25. So our all students was 63%, which is great, and that's an improvement. Uh, actually, that was a bit of a dip, but our I think we were at 70% meeting targets for all students last year, um, but this year our lowest 25% is is awesome we're very proud of that we took a h good hard look at our lowest 25 percent last year when we got that data um and we really looked at these students and you know there's a, probably a misconception that oh it's mostly students on ieps and these are the students that struggle but it's it's just not true there's a lot of students that are struggling out there and we looked at those students and how can we better meet their needs and how can we impact our instruction in such a way to meet the diverse needs of all of them. And we're pretty proud of the progress that we made in that. Um, Dr. Mealy? So overall, you can see, like we said, we went from 58 to 68, um, and the 40 and 
Um, weighting gives us 64%, which is substantial progress towards us meeting our targets. And then this is this is kind of the important the important stuff. It's really like like Principal Jackson said, like so what and where do we go from here? So we're really proud of our improvement from 58% to 68%. Like we we want that. We want to see the growth. And that lowest 25%. Last year I sat here and said, oh, they met they met 45% of their targets. This year they met 74. That's awesome. Like 29 percentage points up for that lowest group. It shows that the work that we did, and like Principal Jackson said, like we had this goal, we set this goal for ourselves, and I feel that a 29% growth is nailing that goal. Um, our all students went down, like I said, oh, I nailed the 70, look at that. So 70 to 63, and it's not a significant dip, but it's a dip. And when you factor in the growth of our, of our lowest 25%, we want to take a look at that. We want to see, we want to make sure that, okay, it's always the balance. Like, how hard do you push the pedal on something, and are you letting the pedal off something else, and how do you kind of have that? Um, one of the big impacts, I believe, is our science achievement. We bombed. Like, we went from three out of four achievement points in 2018 to zero out of four achievement points in uh, 2019, which you wouldn't know, Ms. Picard, unless I told you, right? Because we don't have the data sitting in front of us. So we're looking at how do we do that? And like Principal Gonsalves said, it was the first year being assessed on the new standards. Everybody was kind of revamping. We're talking about how are we adapting to the next generation science standards. And it's really been a state of flux. Like we've really been working towards it and we're getting there and I feel like we're there now. Um, and with this year, the full kind of implementation of the resource of mystery science and talking vertically because that is important, especially because a lot of the content areas at the elementary level switched grades. So some of them are new to these teachers around. So just this week, actually, in our collaboration schedule, we had vertical collaboration. So you know we have 1A, 2A, 3A, all the A's met, the B's met, and the focus was science because we looked at this data and said, all right, we have to have a conversation around this. How are we going to improve this? And truthfully, part of it, it's on me. We have to, I have to be more thoughtful in the scheduling piece because we put so much emphasis, rightfully so, we put so much emphasis on reading, writing, and math, then it's like, okay, make sure you get science in too. But how do we do that more meaningfully? How do we get that into, how do we weave it into our ELA? How do we weave it into our math? Because there are easy ways to do it. Into our writing, there's a ton of great ways through lab reports and the Lucy Calkins program. So it's really about, okay, we're doing pretty well, but this is an area of growth, and how do we, how do we hit it? How do we make science a priority like reading, writing, and math because it is important. And truthfully, we know that science is one of the more engaging ones for the kids. They love getting the hands-on experiments and fifth grade is doing owl pellets in a few weeks and, and they're just, they're really excited for all this stuff. Math, we killed it. I, when we got the data that first day, I shot an email out to my staff immediately. I'm like, you know, in Dr. Joe Williams' words, this is embargo, do not tell anybody this. But we exceeded every target. Every subgroup exceeded their targets. Um, you know, are all students economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, high needs, everything. And I just, I couldn't believe it. And then the growth for that, every subgroup was either typical, typical growth high or exceeded typical growth. And, you know, I sat here last year and I took it on the chin a little bit because we had a dip in math. And I was like, oh, you know, guys, this was our first year of Eureka Math. We were a Go Math school. And I, it, it, they were ripping the Go Math away from me. And we went to Eureka Math. And I said, you know what? This was the first year. It was new to teachers. It was new to kids. It was new to parents. I said, next year, I promise you, we'll, we'll go up a little bit. We'll see that spike. I didn't expect the spike that we saw, but I really attribute that. And one of the first questions I got from my staff was, you know, Joe, do you, do you think it's, is it Eureka? Is Eureka this good? And I'm like, I think Eureka is a great resource, but the resource doesn't matter except for whose hands the resource is in. And my teachers really worked hard that first year to battle through tape diagrams, number bonds, things that we didn't learn back when we were kids and learn about it and understand it. The kids came in knowing what a number bond was or a tape diagram, so that helped. Parents are still working on it. They're trying, it's, it, you know, this new math. Joe, why do we do this new math? I don't know, it's, it's new. <laughs> um, but 
the confidence that we had, our, my staff had going into year two with it, the comfortability with it, it makes a big difference. Um, and we're excited to see where we go. We didn't do ST math at all last year, and we have implemented it this year through the grant, and I'm excited to see what that adds to it. ELA, our all students group met their targets, which is great, um, but when you look at the subgroups, that's where we have some work to do. High needs, um, the various subgroups under high needs, students with disabilities, um, economically disadvantaged, ELs, they either improved below the target, they didn't change, or they declined. Um, so that's really an area that we have to work on. And again, it goes back to that balance, like how much did we push the gas pedal on math and let off on ELA? So how do we find that? And we've had a lot of conversations as, as I've been digging through this with each of my grade level teams. And it's funny, you know, we, we were talking about comparing to the state and my expectations, and I communicate this to my staff, my expectations for our comparison to the state are high. Like I expect us to be much higher. And we dig through the item analysis and we were, I think something like 11 or 12 points below the state average on one item in fourth grade, and it was identify the setting of a story. And I'm like, fourth grade? Like, how do you not ide like identify the setting? Like, where did this take place? But it sparked such a great conversation with my team about making assumptions. And do we just use that, like, setting is something in fourth grade, you kind of just assume they know. Like, it, you, they should be able to tell it. But if you don't ever say the word setting, if you ever don't ever talk about it, and those are the types of conversations that we try to pull. We find the item analysis is the most important piece because we can really look at what um, standard is being addressed and which standards we're doing really well with and which standards we need, um, we need some work on. So really, for me, figuring out this science piece. And I've been talking to some of my staff members this week about the vertical collaboration, how's it going? And one of the focus questions I gave them is, what do these mysteries look like in your room? Like, how are you structuring them differently? And so they've been talking about what the block, you know, the science block looks like, but that it also lends itself to, hey, I'm doing weather for the first time. Oh, I did weather last year, or I did weather three years ago, you know, so they can talk about things that worked and things that clicked with students or successes or failures that they had. Um, and that's really what it's all about. Like, we put this morning collaboration in for a reason, and I think it's, it's paying off. And George Costanza, and on a high, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> not uncommon for the science. Um, I, I think you could be selling yourself short just so that everyone knows. You know, as, a, as someone who had a son who took the fifth grade test, remember the science standards were ado you know, adopted in 2016. Then they give you three years, um, and that's a fast track to implement those changes within your schools. And then they also do realize that 2019, they changed the test with the understanding that some kids may still have learned in third grade the specific standards um, that were the old ones, and it's a work in progress. So it's the, the state really saying, we know you'll get there, but it's also a little bit of a caveat for the particularly the fifth, oh, the fifth and eighth grade science test. Um, so we're that's a focus going into each individual school for those two hour PD days as well. So. Ten seconds. Um, so a comment and a question. So one, I mean, I think the the general trend of this is is great and fantastic, and, and obviously hats off to you and your staff for this. Um, the one that I have, and I don't know if you can get to this level of data, um, but I Chris think. <laughs> You <laughs> all right. <laughs> so I think this is the third year that we've had the combined first and second grade classes. Correct. Oh yeah. So I would be curious to see for those students who have been in those classes, where do they fall in this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it would. You know, I, I'm just curious where they fit. Um, because it, it's been something, uh, this is the third year, right? Or am I wrong? This is the third year. So it would be. So I don't know if any of so them So this would, would be the current third grade? Would no. Second grade. Second yeah, grade, so fourth. One, so two. It would be the current third grade. Yeah. yeah. But some of them would have been second grade. Right. So it's the second. This is the second. Uh, well, the first year. 
Oh yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Because we the first graders stayed right. with her. Yeah. W well, yeah. The, the students that were in that first year of grade one and grade two, they would have been taking this as third graders last year, I think, right? No, because this is the third year. We've had two years. Right, but a second grader in year one would have been a third grader and is currently oh, a Oh, a second grader, grader in year right? one. Right, because – It's the new math, Joe. It's yeah, <laughs> it's the new math, man. I can't – if I had a number bond in front of me, Dave, I would, I would, I would be killing We'll give you a tape. <laughs> um, but I think that would be something interesting yeah, to kind of maybe keep track of because yeah. that's, a, that's a cohort of students yeah. that is pretty isolated um, – from a teacher perspective and a curriculum and all of that in for two full years yeah. um, to see how they trend. I uh, will say, Denise, uh, Denise Coleman, I've, I've asked her if she's giving her the, um, the map data because she goes through and she looks at how her students have performed yeah. on that, like the district mm -hmm. uh, common assessment that we use in third, fourth, and fifth. Um, so she's looked at that, but it's, this is another good measure. That's, right. a, that's a good one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Dig that. Awesome. And, and it's, dig it's that still out. probably a little early. Um, yeah. But if we know who they are, well, let's, let's, let's yeah. prove it. Yeah. I mean, I think we may see in the December 5th revised constitution plan based on ent my entry last year and all the data we've collected over this time. You may see us looking to um, look at other schools possibly doing the same thing because of not just um, how they've done necessarily on MCAS, but all the other results. So that might be a reason why she'll be yep. um, if you're thinking about pushing it further. Um, I've suddenly <laughs> gotten very loud. Um, I, I've suddenly become confused at what I'm looking at. Um, Sorry. <laughs> because I like I thought I, I thought I knew what I was looking at, but I, I now I don't. Because where it says in the in the second um, hollow circle, all students' um, progress towards meeting targets went from 70 percent to 63 percent. I don't see a bar chart like that in here. So I'm suddenly confused where we went from 58 to 68. What is that? Is that different? That's improvement targets. Is that different from targets? That all, if you took the two hollow circles, they're each worth 50% and yep. you get the top number. Okay, and that's where I get the 58, 68. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, and it suddenly occurs to me that in, um, in this chart um i don't know what the top line and the bottom line represent i was thinking that they were ela and math but i no, i suddenly so don't know the top, i know george had the thing on the side right i don't have the thing on the side um the 58 and 68 are our overall meeting target percentage so that's what the first bullet was that's the same as the bar graph yes Fif okay. so 58 was our 2018 how how many targets were met by all our right. students? 68% is 2019. The 40 and 60 is how much those are weighted, and that's where we come up with our okay, overall 64%. I, I think I knew that when Mr. Jackson was talking, and then he I lost nice the thread of it. He, he had a nice little thing on the side, you know. I. We figured by now. <laughs> it's got the labels on it, which okay, makes right. it easier. Thank you. Okay. You know, yeah. it, it, this feels a little <laughs> like algebra. Like I was right. doing it, it was going along, it was good. And, and again, all of a sudden, if I you had a tape diagram, along. you would have. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> right, do we have to say the state is changing the numbers of, from, you know, yeah. the 200s to the 400s? It'll change again. Yeah. They have nothing else to do. Yeah. Good, Joe. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to introduce the principal of the private Albert mm. E. Thompson Elementary, Christopher Raymond. Um, so you've seen a lot of these slides as we go through. Uh, so you can see up there for uh, the Thompson Elementary School, we went from 56 to 54. So we're pretty close. We'd rather be going in an upward direction, but not bad. We're pretty close there. Um, our overall targets, um, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when we get to our trend slide in a little bit, but we were um, – we dipped a little bit, um, so we went from 78 
to 66 percent. And then if we look at our, um, our lowest 25 percent, we actually had an increase in those students. Um, so those students went from 63 percent to 68 percent. So um, a little bit of a difference where overall we went down. Um, the lowest 25 percent of our students actually showed um, some decent growth last year. Um, and then this was the slide that you were all just talking about and apologize on behalf of the elementary schools. We don't have that fancy little thing on the side to help. Um, but we, we made, did make substantial progress towards our targets at 71 percent. And this is something that uh, Kristen and I have looked at really carefully already this fall just in terms of uh, what we've talked about previously, the breakdowns of the different areas and so forth. So in terms of our trends, uh, in ELA, we met our targets in the all students, lowest performing, high needs, and economically disadvantaged students. Um, and uh, one worthy note in that ELA um, trend, uh, the greatest change was in our lowest performing students. They actually went up four and a half scaled points and they it came up ab about a half point over what the target was for 2019. Um, interesting, interestingly, in, in somewhat contrast to what we were just talking about, the, our students exceeded their targets in science. So we did, we performed extremely well in science. Again, um, we, we beat our targets and we went up um, a, a pretty fair amount from the prior year. Um, we're looking at that, sort of trying to um, help explain that. Um, I do know that at Thompson, our teachers had expressed a strong interest in really moving ahead with the next generation science standards. So we did do a lot of work on that last year. That work is ongoing this year. As Ms. Marks had said, we have District PD. Um, I actually met with my lead teacher in FCIs today and we're gonna be looking at um, jumping off of that professional development in January when we have some of our building-based days. Um, so it's, it was definitely good to see that we exceeded our targets in science. Um, one area for growth this year, um, which explains some of the overall drops, is we, we did dip slightly in math this year. Um, and I, I think it's been um, pretty much previously stated, but uh, worth mentioning, one of the things we do, whether we have success or we dip, is really look at um, the item analysis. So we've, we've already looked at a detailed item analysis in the third, fourth, and fifth grade. Um, and I really have to give a shout out to our teachers because they, they did a lot of work in really looking at the data and what they noticed about the data and the comparisons of the data between the two years. Um, and then we go through a protocol, thanks to Kristen, where we kind of look at what we wonder about the data. And so we had some wonders and there were some areas in the items where we did really, really well. We were really strong. There were er items on the test where we uh, dipped a little bit, um, similar to what um, has been previously mentioned. I, I think Joe mentioned it. We joked about some of the items where we dipped. It's like, how could they, you know, how did we dip in that? And you also have to look at the items in terms of how they're weighted. So how many items are we talking about on the test? Was this one item or were there, were there seven different items for this? So there's a lot that goes into, excuse me, into looking at that. Um, so w I was super impressed with our teachers when they were talking about their wonders, um, just in terms of talking about their practice and some really intentional things that they're doing or that they could do. Um, or some changes that they were going to make this year just based on the data, whether it was in math um, or ELA. So uh, I, I think it's important for you all to know that that work, um, while it's been going on, that's work that will be ongoing and we'll continue to do that work throughout the year. In addition, we've got to take a real micro look at the kids and the data. Um, as an example, really in looking at, if you take math as an example, um, I really started to look through the cutoffs for where kids scored. And you can make the same argument for kids who maybe met the, met the expectations where the maybe they bumped into that category by a question or two. Um, but I was looking at the kids who were close. And it's interesting to sort of look at the data behind the data and really look at the kids who missed maybe 
going into the next category, say they were impartially meeting expectations, and if they answered one more question, they would have been meeting expectations. So that you look at, and so that's where it becomes an issue of what do you know about the student, what have we put in place, what relationship do we have with the student, and are we talking about is this a, is this a test issue, is this a stamina issue, um, you know, there's a, a whole host of things that enter into that. So I think it's just important for you to know, I think we all go really deeply and we look at the data that deeply. Um, uh, just in terms of math, our high needs students and students with disabilities did not meet their targets. So um, we're going to be really taking a, a, a hard look at that and, and looking at uh, the lowest 25% has been mentioned previously. Uh, really looking at our EL, EL students, I think Atkinson and us, we, we share a, a pretty sizable number of EL students. So we want to look across the board at our different groups and see how all of our students did. Um, in some cases, our students performed, as the data points out, much better in ELA. And some of those same students who scored really strongly in ELA dipped in math. So we, we really want to kind of take a look at that and go through the item analysis and see why that might be the case. The final thing up there um, on that trend slide, which um, we've been talking about. So as you know, and, and I'm going to preface this by saying this is in by no means an excuse for our data at all. So I, I want to make that really clear. But it is an interesting factor in terms of our data. So last year, as you know, we had the gas explosions which happened right at the beginning of the year. And arguably, we were most impacted by that in, in the district. I think at one point, I said to Kristen, I estimate we probably had about 40% of our families impacted in some way. It definitely impacted overall attendance. Um, it impacted tardiness. Um, but one of the other things I think about with that behind it all is we had a number of students who were coming to school every day with a lot on their mind because they had resource issues, um, they were outplaced, their parents were stressed, they were feeling that stress. Um, we had families in hotels from Woburn all the way up to the North Shore um, scattered about. Um, and this happened, as you know, up, and up, up almost until the December holidays when we broke. So I think what's hard to account for is how much of that impacted what ended up happening in the classroom when students took this test. Because in part, these tests are based on what's coming before and what kids have learned cumulatively as they sit down for these couple of days and take the test. Um, so again, it's here. How did it impact? We're not really sure. If you look at attendance um, counting for 10% of your accountability, we actually dipped in our data 10%. So I'm not saying that's, that's where it is. Um, where it's certainly not an excuse. Um, but it, it must, it's got to factor in in some way. So what we're going to look at going forward, obviously, as we go into this next year and we take the test, because you know there's no gas explosions, uh, a once-in-a-lifetime thing, um, how are we doing this year um, with our achievement? Um, and I, and I got to thank Kristen for all her support and, and Lorene, not only for helping us with the slides, but just also the time and effort that they've been um, putting in, coming out. Kristen and I have met several times um, to go through um, with the staff. We're going to be meeting soon to really take a harder look at the lowest 25%. We have coaches that are going to be coming in and working with um, some of our teams. I had a fantastic meeting uh, today with my fourth grade team, just really looking at uh, the needs in fourth grade. and. What's interesting when we look at our math achievement, um, it appears that some of the third graders have some struggles who are now fourth graders. Um, we also have a significant number of kids in a variety of subgroups in that grade. So it's definitely something that we want to pay careful attention to. Um, so again, um, you know, uh, I'll leave you with a, a little story just about, because one of the things we haven't talked about too much is behind the data, there's students. So um, just as a testament to uh, sort of student perseverance and grit, last year during this test, despite everything that happened in the beginning of the year with our, our community, um, I really remember later in the year when we were taking this test, there were at least four or five students that 
they were like the one or two kids left in their class that were still taking the test and their 20 peers were done. And so we have provisions for that where you know they might come with me or they might go to another location so they can finish it privately because it's hard to be working when 20 of your peers are done and they all have their books out and you're feeling like you're the last student in the class. And um, I remember four to five kids for almost all the test sessions in my office at 2.58 in the afternoon looking exactly the same way they did, putting in the same amount of effort with the same amount of perseverance as they did at 9 o'clock in the morning. And you know, they, had, they had lunch and they had recess, but that is it. They were testing. And I, I say, gosh, love those students who were just sitting there doing that. So um, I think it's a testament to no matter how those students did on the test, they certainly gave it their all and gave it their effort, and that's, that's important. I think, that, you know, um, it's great kids. So we have great staff, great kids. Um, shout out to the Thompson staff, hardworking group, and thank you all. Thanks. Any questions? Go ahead. So, well, um, so we heard, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of. So we heard that you know, Franklin did really well on math, and maybe they were pushing the accelerator harder on that, and and the whole Eureka math. Eureka math two years old for Thompson as mm -hmm. well. Is is that something you're looking at in terms of more, do people need more training or is it not clicking as a process? I, I'm just curious if that might be part of it. Mm -hmm. I think we should talk about this a little bit. It's interesting because we have, the numbers we have to compare are from how many, like what percentage of targets were met last year versus what percentage of targets were met this year, but all the kids aren't exactly the same. Right. So that's that's the hard part is that, um, you know, Chris worked with his team on item analysis and is it uh, particular strands in math? Is it fractions? Is it, you know, right, I mean right. what's going on? Like what patterns do we see? But it's really hard to drill down like that closely because the thir three through fi fifth graders in 2018 aren't the same. A lot of the kids are the same, but they right. aren't the same for 2019. And so, and then when we're talking about these growth scores, zero out of four, it's average scaled score. So take all the kids, average all their scaled mm -hmm. scores together, and then let's say your average scaled score is 500, the state sets a goal of 505. And so, you know what I mean? Like, right. and how far are you from that target? Right. And so in 2018, um, at the Thompson, math achievement was four out of four possible points, and in 2019, we were at one of out of four possible points. Mm -hmm. So it's now it's the mystery to figure out like right. what happened, which kids, which standards, what content. But so. should you have any challenges with that, that would be something that you would mm -hmm. mention. So a couple of things that we've done. Um, we're going to be looking at science through some of our building-based PD because we've already s had started that effort. Um, but through collaboration, we're going to keep a, a real focus on math um, in the upper grades. Um, and as Kristen said, we, we drill down about as deeply as we can go with her support. And in some cases, it's um, some of the particular math strands or standards where we see struggles. Um, I think some of the other things to, to consider are really looking across at our subgroups. The Eureka program is very language-based, so if we have students who struggle with language um, or who struggle with reading, comparing some of the kids who didn't perform well in math with some of the, how did they do in, in the ELA area. That's interesting. Um, this is where ST math can come in for some of the kids because it's, it's picture-based, it's visual, it's n it they don't have need the words, uh, they don't have the words, excuse me. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider in the math scores, and um, I think the fact that Eureka is a language-based program, um, you know, if we have a significant number of kids, which, you know, when thinking about some of the kids we have who have moved into the, now into our fourth grade, we do have some kids with some significant um, difficulties in that area, which would make math more of a challenge for them to begin with. So, um, so we'll be looking at that with the, with the teachers. Um, and as I say, just today I had a wonderful collaboration with the teachers in which we kind of outlined successes, um, the kind of the pitfalls that are going on, what they're doing intentionally in the class. And um, the impressive thing is some of the adjustments they continue to make every day or every week on the fly to sort of meet the needs of kids and how well they know each of the kids in their class just down to, you know, this student needs blah, 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 so I do this, and this student needs this, so this is what we're doing after lunch instead of this, where the rest of my class is doing this, for these two kids I'm doing this. 
and how and in what way they're using, uh, if they have a teaching assistant or so forth, intentionally so. And uh, so we're going to be working uh, going forward with um, Jenna, math coach, and others to kind of take a look at that, continue to take a look at it. So. Mm -hmm. One, I mean, I, I think it's fantastic, um, you know, the advancements in, or, or hitting the targets, I should say, in, in science. And, and I think it's kind of interesting, your, your point and your reference, and I think it's probably pretty valid in terms of the math and the English and, and all of that. Um, but I don't want to minimize the very last point that you have there um, in terms of the absenteeism. Um, <coughs> I mean, obviously, your, your school district, you know, was probably the largest impacted uh, in our town. Um, you know, it's not just crops and cr chronic absenteeism, it's tardiness, it's fear, it's worrying about their friends, it's travel, it's not necessarily being in a home and in, in a hotel and all of those things, which I think, you know, just for, for a student who's nine years old or 10 years old or, you know, a any of them, you know, at, at your school, I mean, that's, that <coughs> excuse me, truly traumatic. Um, and I think for them, you know, to really kind of hold their own, you know, at that point, um, just speaks volumes to, to the students that are there and their families, um, and then you know the staff that were just there to make them feel safe um, in school. And so, you know, I, the, these scores don't necessarily, uh, I think, speak to the incidents that happened mm -hmm. uh, at that school. And, and I just, I, I think you're right to put it there, but mm -hmm. I don't think you're right to kind of like minimize it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very significant, and I and I think it n it needs to be really noted. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's hard. It's hard to know how much to overstate it or uh, understate that that fact. And and to your to your point, when kids are stressed about things going on at home, um, maybe their family has been really they've been outplaced. They're in a hotel that comes with just the day to day stressors. We know for a fact we had people who they left school and they were at the Y and they did the you know everyone took a shower. And then they got food, and then by the time they got home, it's 7:30 at night. So the homework suffered. The like when you're when you're running on, we just got to get everybody showered and fed. Um, and then we're expecting the kids to sit in class and do reading, writing, math, and those things. So right. I think it's the resilience of the kids, but it's also the, the kids are incredibly resilient. But it's also hard with all that stuff going on. So um, it's it's a fair point. Thank you. You know, just. You know, I wanted to make it clear, I, I would never want anyone to think we ever use any of those things as an excuse. It is a fact, but um, hard to know how much it factors into the data. So I guess well, we'll, you know, we'll see over time. It was interesting when you look at the standards and the topics and which ones were difficult and which ones of those were taught, you know, on September 16th, mm -hmm. you know, versus those that were taught, you know, closer to date. and. Yeah, I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about that either. Mm -hmm. So that's a good. It, it, uh, give it us may not think be about. that you need. Right. You're going to be up all night. <laughs> 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 the raw data of it, though, is that the state measures achievement 67.5%, growth 22.5%, and additional indicators for, and at the Thompson, the only additional indicator is chronic absenteeism. And so there's this invisible yeah. impact that we have on a school, but then there's a very real impact of 10%, where Thompson schools scored zero because they had kids who were chronically absent and there was no way to avoid it. And so it's really important to, but I hadn't thought about like which topics taught during the That's year. So there's this invisible mm -hmm. impact. Right. And right. then there's a very visible impact according to the state as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank right. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, uh, principal of the Annie L. Sargent School, Karen Wesley. <laughs> um, I should tell you before we look at my slides that they're missing something very important, and that is, before I start, it's missing spaces, all the spaces that should be on that, because when I sat here t almost three years ago for the first time for Sargent School, I didn't feel as wonderful as I do tonight to share about the wonderful teamwork that's happened at Sargent School. So if I had my way, my slides would have um, first the pictures of almost 500 kids on it, and then it would have the pictures of the staff, and not just the teachers, but I, I say it with great conviction that it's um, teachers, teaching assistants, best custodian in the district, shout out to Pat, um, people in the cafeteria, 
that we've just done a good job of coming together and what I've pounded into the ground, they can read it before I say it, um, is that we, every student belongs to us. I know it sounds cliche-ish, but that's really one of the, mo of the mantras that's happened in the work that we've done in the last three years, or almost three years. So in the slides, I, I think we can s zoom through them because you all have hard copies of them. I'm a sharp learner. Um, I want to jump right to my trends, if that's okay. I mean, is that bad, Kristen? Do you want to go through all of them? <laughs> I'm just thinking you all know this. I, I'm very excited to see these and share them with you. Um, the ones that I'm most pleased to share on the um, uh, one right before that, Jim, Dr. Mueller, if you wouldn't mind, thank you, is um, from 2018 for the Sergeant Cumulative Progress uh, towards targets uh, was 2018 was 81%, we went uh, to 84%. And then in 2018 on the, um, that would be Kristen, the tw lower 25%. Nope, nope, so the two 2018 is weighted 40% and 2019 is weighted 60% and your cumulative is 83%, which is meeting or exceeding targets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, Helen, on the, the whole thing, okay? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> hence why I wanted to slide right through the slides. <laughs> um, what I want you to know um, on the trends at Sargent School is meeting or ex exceeding targets. We are thrilled about that. It was, um, I've done a lot of coaching my days from coaching lacrosse and preparing for state tournament and feeling when you really get to the state championship. There was a great faculty meeting that we celebrated um, when these came out and Kristen shared it and, and broke it down for us. I used to say, and I still say to this, teachers that um, I was frustrated three years ago when I became principal to see the scores of the school and have it not reflect how hard the teachers worked. How hard the kids worked, but how hard the teachers worked. And um, that's what was the real celebration for us this year was to be able to see um, the teachers understanding from some of the work that we did together um, that it's reflective of how hard the kids are working, but it, it, it really is a signature about what the teachers are doing too. Um, overall, from the 81% to 84% meeting targets, and then uh, we started last year with um, one of the empty ki kindergarten classrooms. We made it into a data room. I, uh, the year before, I had taken the staff and we went to a school in Haverhill that was a turnaround school, and I we brought a teacher representative from every grade level. And one of the things they did was they actually identified students with magnets and they used the free pictures that come from Hawkmeyer and we were able, I went back and I said, we have this beautiful big room and um, with the help of Kristen and um, so many people that were part of the team with that, that we put up the magnets on every grade le uh, reading level of every student so we were able to track and then we specifically targeted the lowest 25% of the school in reading and in um, assessing and running records. And that's one of the things that we're very excited about from the lowest 25% met 74% of their targets in 2018. And then last year with the start of the data room and the focus on them, we went from 74% to 90% this past year. Um, and so some of the things that I just don't wanna step away before I tell you is that why did that happen at Sargent School? I would tell you that the success has to do with our community and, it, and it's not, I can't overstate it enough. Um, I think that it starts with the kids. Certainly that's what why we're there is the 500 kids or almost five that are there. But um, it's having the parent base that we have of really parents that are, uh, I can't tell you the numbers of that are volunteering and helping and all in and then um, the whole staff itself. But every good ship and every good team needs a good leader and good leaders we have and it's, um, I really want you to know that you should continue to expect great things from Erin O'Loughlin. Erin was with me for the last two years as a vice principal, and so the work that we did together is only going to just take Erin and she's gonna soar at Atkinson School, I'll put money on it. Um, <laughs> Kristen Ando, when I met Kristen and knew that I needed that area of growth for me in um, the data, no, nope. <laughs> 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 all right, I will. Kristen. Kristen came and had a whole bunch of uh, MCAS data and everything put uh, to meet with me for the first time when I met her. I said, I need to know what you know because I know what I don't know around this. I wanna get on your calendar. I met with her every single Thursday all year last year. And when she came into the first meeting, she gave me all this paperwork 
um, and I thoughtfully put it somewhere, but when she came back for the second week meeting the following week, I said, I'm not really sure where that, and she just looked at me and said, don't ever lose my data again. <laughs> so on the, the, on the third, <laughs> On the third meeting, I had a three-ring binder with every ounce of data, and we've had a love affair since then. Uh, Ms. Leahy asked me if Krista could have an office there <laughs> instead of here in central office. Which, which leads me to the other part of the leadership team, um, that Aaron, Kristen, Deb Holman, as her, her lens as a former principal and staff developer and now in special education has been tremendous. The coaches, Jackie and Ann, Carol Larcom, um, the same thing. It's been a real team effort. When I say community, that's what I mean by it. And um, I am excited that that relationship that we've built with each other as a, as a leadership team has really been what has been the catalyst, I think, of the success. And um, that goes into the leadership of the teachers as well. Um, because if you see on the next trend, I have a, a diving deeper um, in that when I think of that, we've just started with a data, a deep dive, we're calling it, going with the theme of the Sergeant Sharks, a deep dive data team. And it's um, th three different teachers representative of the uh, first grade and fourth grades. And um, we are now taking a look through the help of Kristen with uh, um, starting to pull out some of the data in a deeper, more um, meaningful way on the economically disadvantaged. We realize that they declined in ELA but they exceeded in their targeted math. Um, special education was interesting also. We had, uh, they met their targets in ELA, but yet declined in math. Um, so this also ties in again with the community piece of it, of the SEL work that we've been doing on the complexities of our learners and that we've talked a lot about this as a staff. Um, when we did staff development in my first year, with Dr. Dioria, that's what he said. We have a more complex base of students, and so our teachers, we need to become more nimble in our learning and our practice. That keeps, that continues to be our mantra in our staff development is how do we get better, how do we stay agile, and that happens with what a lot of my colleagues have already talked about with um, the collaboration, which is so valuable. I've copied Joe and steal lots of great things from him with the vertical collaboration we just started where we're mixing it up with um, grades one through five, sitting down together um, once a month, and um, the staff development, I think, is happening because of the great conversations that are happening among them. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, last but not least. <laughs> yes, uh, principal of the Dr. Kittredge School. I'm not sure which Dr. Kittredge it is. Because uh, there were several of them, but uh, Richard Cushing. I understand it was Dr. Kittredge, who was uh, who was definitely uh, very uh, uh, instrumental in helping with uh, some of the uh, early uh, diseases that were here uh, in the United States during the uh, colonial times. You know, so. Working on soon with all the I think so maybe what I'll do is put a few of the raisins on that, you know, and it'll be one of their research projects. So, anyways, I, what what I'd really like to do is start off by, uh, you know, looking at you know the accountability percentile and just look at, you know, that we still are in the 80th percentile of uh, uh, when you know we look at the accountability, and I'm not so sure, you know, just going back to something that Helen said. Uh, I'm not sure that the bars that we're going to look at really reflect necessarily all of the success that we had through the test, you know, in a lot of our groups. Uh, however, if you look at the, uh, you know, progress to, uh, towards uh, improvement targets, you know, when we look at our, uh, you know, uh, the progress this year, you know, did go down to 56% from 88%. However, if you looked at, you know, some of what those target goals were, they were actually very high based on the 88% of last year. However, there was one subgroup that really, you know, took a hit last year, and that was our lowest 25%. You know, uh, the year before, we hit, uh, we had a 91%, I believe, success rate with that group. 
and uh, last year we dipped down to 34 percent. Now, I think that some of that had to do with some of the new moves that we had d we did at Kittredge. Uh, we definitely gave the Eureka uh, math program fidelity last year. And I have to say, we didn't do that prior to last year. So a lot of our collaboration time definitely was spent on what we might call maybe mini PD. Because what we did was we went full blown with the Calkins reading program, the writing program, Eureka Math. And I think that some of that time that we used to spend during collaboration looking at those kids that were falling below benchmark and that lowest 25% didn't necessarily happen last year. And so I think that that might have impacted us. Also, when we look at Eureka Math, we were using that, like I said, with fidelity. So we didn't really look at you know, the modifications that we needed to make to the program for some of those kids, as well as you know, uh, maybe some of the accommodations that we used to use when we were using other programs for mathematics. So I think that's something that we're already looking at. We're really focused on that right now. Uh, that's what we're using our collaboration time with. Uh, we identified you know, that lowest 25% this year early, and that was with the help with Kristen, and then also looking at some of our, uh, our own assessments at school, some of our formative assessments, as well as some of the district-wide assessments. So if you look at uh, you know, our uh, uh, cumulative uh, progress over the past two years is at 69%, which is still you know, for, the, uh, for the state, it's, it's pretty high. And uh, so we're still, but we're still looking at, again, you know, it, it just, it's troubling because we really did that low, that cohort of that lowest 25 did kind of bring the numbers down. Now we're talking about 22 kids uh, because of the numbers of kids at the Kittredge Elementary School. So, you know, those kids, 22, have a major impact on, you know, what the numbers would look, look like. So, uh, uh, so for us, you know, we have identified those kids now, you know, you know, because obviously the third graders that took the test, you know, weren't part of that lowest 25, but through end of year assessments last year, as well as some of the assessments that we've done this year, we've identified those kids that will be in fourth grade that will be in that 25%. So we're already looking at, you know, uh, implementing interventions for those kids as well as uh, you know looking at you know what are the basic needs what are those you know maybe uh, areas that uh, uh, they really need remediation in so and uh, the trends obviously we're looking at those lowest 25 right now you know we had such a decrease you know in them hitting their uh, objectives uh, that we want to make sure that we have a plan for all of those 22 kids and we're following it. And of course, you know, these are just the 22 kids that are falling be below benchmark. They're not necessarily part of our subgroup that of uh, uh, like our special needs kids. And, and so, so again, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's easy enough for us to identify who they are, you know. Uh, again, all, the all students stayed uh, the same, you know, as last year, and we hit those targets at 78 percent. So, you know, even going to all the new programs and everything, we still, with the majority of the kids, you know, because now we're talking about was that 75 percent of the kids, you know, we did hit 78 percent of the targets. Uh, What's that? Are you yeah. saying that 78 percent of the kids roughly scored the same in 2018 and 2019? No, you, no, you can't say that because you know we, that, we, we're talking about different cohorts. That, What's that? In the category. In the category. Okay. So in 2018, 
the all students category met 78% of the targets set by the DESE. In 2019, the all students category met 78% of the targets set. Okay. So it's not <coughs> kids, it's the target set. It's the okay. Okay. I think it's mm -hmm. just worded funny. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. And, uh, you know, uh, high need students uh, uh, with disabilities exceeded uh, their targets in ELA. Uh, both uh, our groups, the lowest 25 percent, as well as the uh, uh, students with disabilities uh, met their targets in math. Uh, our lowest performing group uh, is struggling the most in math. And I think that that really had to do with, you know, uh, our teachers really becoming very adept to, you know, the Eureka program, you know, the, uh, uh, and now this year we're already really looking at, you know, working with uh, 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 Tara, uh, you know, as in developing what we need to do, you know, for those kids. Yeah, so uh, I think that, uh, but all in all, we did very well last year. You know, we look to do the same this year. You know, I think, uh, you know, the focus is uh, always the students, you know, the uh, uh, and uh, academics, but also the whole student, you know, looking at also their social and emotional growth also as that impacts their academics. How'd you do in science? We did well. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, but we did we did met all the targets. It's, ju it's just interesting because I know you know one of our schools is like oh we need to work on science and another one's like we did really well in science. Mm -hmm. So, well we're working on the science also. You know what we did was last year we started to look at you know the standards and how they changed uh, grade level wise. So we really started to analyze you know what were we doing in second grade that really now needs to be done in fourth grade? Mm -hmm. You know, what, do, what are we doing in first grade that might be a third grade uh, standard now? So we started to realign, you know, how we were teaching things, you know, which is important. And uh, I mean, I think that there's such stress now with, uh, with the state on, you know, aligning, you know, the standards to particular grade levels that I could only think that it's not going to necessarily always be a cumulative, you know, type of exam where it doesn't matter if you teach it in third grade or second grade or fourth grade, you know, that would only, you know, we're, we're testing in fifth grade, mm -hmm. you know, I think eventually we'll have a countability at other grade levels too, you know. So it behooves us right now to really look at, you know, what are we teaching, when are we teaching, what are kids supposed to know at a particular grade level, and uh, and move forward with that with that. So yeah, I mean that that's just something we are working on. There's no question. And and I would just comment that um, it's really humbling and um, obvious of the complexity of both the tests and the student bodies because, you know, it looked like you had the secret sauce. And if everybody just did what you did, we'd have 91% targets met um, for this lowest 25%. And then you come in with these really very different numbers and it really just, you know, again, speaks to how complex the whole process is and that it's not all replicable from one school to another or from one district no. to another. No, or for one cohort to the next cohort that you have, you know, you yeah. know, moving through. So I think, you know, however, you know, I mean, with, you know, how we do analyze data now, analyze, you know, what students need to know, what they need to learn, you know, we are able to, you know, I mean, I, please, I can look back and see, you know, the reasons why, okay, and they're not excuses, you know. However, I can see the reasons why we might have failed at this 25%, uh, you know, and so, we need to make sure that we have fail safes uh, uh, so that doesn't occur again, you know. And so, so I mean, all of this, you know, uh, uh, gets to the pit of my stomach because I want the best for all of the kids that come into the Kittredge Elementary School. I know it's the elementary principals that are, are left here, but middle school and high school as well. Sorry. 
staff as well, there have been a lot of changes, as you are all well aware. There have been a lot of curriculum changes. There have been a lot of expectations that have been placed on both principals and teachers that did not exist when I was a principal or when Dr. Gilligan was a principal. And for some teachers, it's been easier than for other teachers. And I, I can speak to probably every single principal here in this room, situations with teachers that principals had to be in difficult situations and have some difficult conversations in order to move things forward. Um, and they have done that. And uh, it's, it's a changed game, really, in the last few years. Um, and I, I, again, feel that the support of the curriculum team, I think um, Kristen's knowledge about MCAS and data has been a huge, huge support to everyone. Thank you. And Kara and our coaches and our last year's um, coach, who's no longer with us this year, Val, they worked very, very hard at every school. And when I would go to meetings, I would see principals now sitting at those meetings, which is not something that happened maybe four years ago. So I just, I just, there are a lot of, like when you talk about complexities, there are a lot of things that go into this. And um, I just want to commend the principals, I want to commend the staff. Th this has not been an easy road. And I want to commend the coaching and curriculum team because um, it's not always easy to be that person either to go into some of those situations. But everybody has really pulled together and um, we are very fortunate in this district. So. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just say one? Thank you. Yeah. It is brief. I, I did jot a couple notes here and I think it's really important to note that overall, uh, the district really made tremendous progress. And as a district, we require no state intervention. I think it's also really important to note that all of the schools, um, you know, and as, as a district, we all made, it, we were designated a substantial progress towards our targets. Uh, all of the schools made substantial progress to their targets. And the middle school was labeled as moderate, but what was amazing there is the growth of meeting, you know, hitting those targets went from 26% to 56%, which is absolutely remarkable. And last but not least, you know, the Sargent School met or was exceeding targets, and that's uh, that's a big jump from where they were uh, just a few years ago. And I'd want to say this, that MCAS is just a snapshot in time, and that um, we're very lucky that we're put, you've had a lot of changes in leadership in the central office and in some of the schools, and we're lucky to have Kristen and Karen and Lorene and Dr. Bailey and Marcy participating um, here. Principals set the culture and set the expectations within a school. They really drive that. And that culture is the most important thing you can do in a school to have a climate of high expectations and supporting kids, um, which I think is critical. When Ms. Leahy was talking about there's faces to those kids, well, part of creating that culture is now there's faces not only to just the teachers who are on the front lines doing this work day in and day out, but when we have Cheryl Bozak in to do the nurses reports and the support they get from them, when we have the counselors that do their work, when we have the TAs that do their work, when we have a custodian cover a morning meeting and get to know kids, um, it's absolutely remarkable. I think some of the foresight in terms of the computer-based testing change and putting keyboarding in at all the elementary schools has made a significant um, uh, change for us. And, you know, to Mr. Raymond's point, I would say this. I was actually, and we had this discussion as a, as a group, um, I thought that the gas uh, disaster would probably impact us more. And I think it's a credit to, we're talking about parents and kids with grit, persistence, resilience um, in the face of great adversity um, on a daily basis. And um, I think a lot of what helped was the support of the community um, to help mitigate some of that and not all of that. And I actually really thought it would have a much bigger impact on not only Thompson, but possibly Atkinson as well. Uh, they had a lot of families done. And um, I would say last but not least, um, we've got work to do ahead. There's work to do. And, um, you know, we've made some really great gains, particularly in the lowest 25%. But there's always going to be work to do, particularly around as we get students who are just new to our district, DL students, special education students, students who have food insecurity, um, students who get it right away and need challenge. And uh, I couldn't be more proud to call these folks colleagues. And I'm excited about you know, the long-term work we're going to do here in North Andover. Um, and I think hats off to you. And I look forward to continuing to work with this board, the new town manager, Melissa Murphy Rodriguez, um, to really push this district forward to what's best for kids. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Okay, 
we're a little over scheduled, so let's uh, maybe pick up the pace a little bit. Um, just quickly on the chair's report, the dates for our next uh, next meeting is January through June. Um, the feedback that I got is March 5th is a problem for two of the members. Everything else I think is fine now. We did move, I think, at an Andrew's suggestion, the, the 7th and May 14th. I think that's fine. Am I missing that? Is just the March 5th date, I think, was not good for Holly and Amy. Is that correct? Okay. Um, well, my recommendation would, would just be to go to the, I don't know if this is going to cause more problems, but just to go to the 12th at this point. Get rid of March 5th and go to March March 12th instead. That's that's my recommendation, but um, I think that was the, the, the only one we changed. I'm waiting <laughs> for a bit. Okay. Did you go to Helen? It's better for me to switch. That's good. I, are you waiting in my list? There's a bit. All right. So, could I have a motion to accept the dates as presented in the packet, except for moving March 5th to March 12th? I move to accept the dates as presented in the packet, which is changing from March 5th to March 12th. Is there a second? Second. Other than uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? Yeah. I, 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 I'm just going to ask, a, 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 and I don't know, and, and maybe Helen and Holly know, I think the election is the 26th, is that correct? Yeah. It's a lot, 20, it's, sorry? March 31st. Okay, all right, I'm just making sure it wasn't the same day. Okay, all right, that's fine. Sorry. Okay, so again, uh, present the packet, move March 5th to March 12th, and all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that's five votes. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Uh, old business, I think. Any updates on these? Uh, Ms. Lorraine? Just, uh, yeah, if, if the trip was canceled, um, I think it was the only overseas one in the packet, if I remember correctly. So there's yep. information yeah. here for each of you that you can take um, in regards to their policies. Um, they have very clear cancellation policies. They have very clear lines of communication. For example, if they're, th when the trip to France was um, scheduled before, yeah, there was oh, threats, threatening. terrorist threats, so right. they have very clear policies with the uh, Ministry of the Interiors of those countries. Okay. Yep. So that's all outlined there as well. Okay. And, um, Chris Carroll also okay. pr just provided anecdotal evidence to um, regarding the France trip and what a great tr uh, great job this company did. Okay. So, so it's all there. I, I, I don't think, I mean, it's all very clear. I don't think you'll have any concerns or questions about it. So. Is there a cost to any of the cancellations? Yes. There's, um, well, there are percentages and the first, the first page in purple, you have trip cancellation, trip cost, trip interruption, 150% of the trip cost. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the packet that we're using to get that from. Well, there, well, there are some things on the second page that, yeah, uh, that explains. Okay. Well, it does say yeah. first yeah. incident um, within 30 days. It doesn't say it's in the last paragraph of this packet, but it does say the cost for that trip if we're using. I was just curious if it's even feasible. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what was the question? I might have found it on, on page two. So I was looking here, yep. but I, there's no cost for that oh, like, benefit. Oh, like an insurance cost? Right, the cost to purchase it. To purchase the insurance. Oh, yeah. That's what yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. It's part okay. of the cost. Yeah, it 
turn here when we Let's see if we got an offer. What does say if you purchase or cancel for any reason protection and you cancel your trip for any reason not otherwise covered by this plan? So it makes me think that there is a cost to purchase. That's that's why I, I think your question is question. Yeah. The union, it sounds like they're giving it up front. Um, the the non-refundable part of the trip, whatever that amount is, it sounds like the set seventy-five percent of that is what you it costs you for the um, oh, yes. cancel for any reason. I see that now. Yeah. Now it's the trip. We did have to um, to a few years ago the signed up and paid partially for the trip when um, the high school decided to cancel this tour group fully refunded the money without any issue so I think that was different than the for any reason yeah one. Mm -hmm. it, it, it does say on I guess the page it says four um, all groups traveling by plane are covered by forums complete cancellation travel protection and emergency medical insurance package so somewhat quickly I'm Believing that to be included. Mm -hmm. Did you want to put this off till next time to get more information, or uh, it's, it's not it's not going till a year from now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And not till next yeah. fall. So if you have two, very specific questions about the insurance, I can try to get that information again. I I, I think I'm comfortable with it, um, but it, it is it doesn't say that there's any cost there. Um, I think it's included. I'm assuming it sounds it's included. like it's included in case of, you know, if the State Department issues warnings and those types of things. Right. What you're saying is there is additional things. For example, so if the trip's not canceled as well as school, but someone has their own personal piece, do they have to purchase additional insurance? Which my, my guess may be yes, but I wouldn't. Yeah, because it's an employee trip. It's not right. just the overseas trips. Right. I'm okay with it. I have a motion to accept the, uh, the trip Aye. back to Green Packet. So moved. Moved for by France. Ms. Mabley. Second. Oops. Either one. Double AM. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0 vote. Okay. Uh, second reading approval overnight trip to Washington, D.C. This has been. Uh, motion made by Ms. Mabley, seconded by Mr. McDevitt. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Five Helen had a question. Oh, I'm, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask. Um, this is for AMPLOT students and um, and um, AP US and history. AP history. Um, are any of these students um, at our, C our college and career prep level, or are they all honors and advanced? There is a tiny bit of them. Let me see if it says. And it, it's not going to impact my, I mean, I'm, I'm going to vote yes on this, but I'm going to continue to encourage that um, students who are not necessarily at the honors or AP level have an opportunity um, for these kinds of, it I mean, it's travel to DC. Here, I can ask, mm -hmm. and I can just let you know. Doing that is, I do know that uh, this originally was counted as an just an in college at one point, and then it was expanded to. Yeah, it's not, I know it's more than. Then it was expanded to honors. It's definitely because I went to on the trip. But but Am is Amplot an honors level course? That's my question. Uh, we'd have to check. At one point, American thought was was notes. AP, and then I'd have to it's, double it's check. Half the the Eng it's like AP English, yeah. and then honors U.S. History yeah. as a integrated yeah. course. So that so. This is not offered to any student who is at the college and career prep level or the traditional level, whatever we're calling let that. Me, let me check on that because I'm not certain. She because doesn't, it doesn't say here that it, is, that it is restricted. I know there were a lot of kids that went last year. I don't know that they were all particularly part of that class. What I want to say is originally it was just American thought. And what I know I chaperoned a couple of years ago, it was not only American thought, but it was another section um, that may have just been honest history that wasn't in an interdisciplinary course. So duly noted for the record your point about uh, overnight. Yeah, I, my daughter went on a trip last year.
last year, and it was those two courses, but I don't think it was saying if someone from another U.S. history said, I want to go on this trip, I don't think that it's precluded that you must be taking that course, but that would be a good question to find out. So, I mean, one of the things that NIAS asked us was how are we providing opportunities for all students? Um, so that's what I'm asking. Okay. Thank you. It's a very skinny form that they fill out, which is why we've started to try to have people come here because you ask questions that I may not necessarily yeah, yeah, yeah. have the information on from these forms. So I will go back and get that for you. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. So that's not the answer. Is that no, no, I'm all good. So just to be clear, uh, motion by Ms. Mabley, second by Mr. McDevitt. <coughs> all those in favor say aye. Five zero vote. Aye. Okay. Aye. 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 All right. Well, I think if we're going to do that, we should do it on, on the first reading of it. Yeah, um, I agree. You know, and, but a lot of these are duplicate. I mean, this trip's been going on for a while, so. Yeah. I, I do think that, that I think they, they, they And I hate to see someone wait two hours, two and a half hours for it as well. So. I do know that you guys, uh, the board has made significant progress on in getting more information about these trips and thinking mm -hmm. about equity and all those things. And the forms standardize and getting more information, I think it's the most we've ever had. And I think that's a good thing to continue. I, I think in the past, the forms were very completely different. And so we would literally go like, it doesn't say anything about chaperones. And right. where's <laughs> that? And they'd go like, oh, well, we'll find out. And then they would come back, right? So yep. now the standard form, you know, making sure we've got safe bus transportation that is appropriate, um, you know, all of those are kind of in place. I don't want to say nipped it, but it has nipped most of the questions. We're making substantial progress. <laughs> Significant. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> at the risk of upsetting um, the apple cart here, uh, Mr. Anderson, was, was, well, who was here last week on this other one? Not, not uh, Charles. Bennett or Hearn. Hearn. Yeah. Hearn. Okay, so we kind of went, went through this last week. Are there any questions on this one? So I would make a motion to approve the alternative trip as presented in the packet. Second. Uh, motion by Ms. Mabley, second by Ms. McDevitt. Any further discussion? We've covered a lot of this last week. Mm -hmm. oh, no, you have, you have other questions about it, Holly? No, nothing about it? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 That's 5 0. Okay, great. Thank you. Good questions. Um, Dr. Mailey on budget status? The last budget status report, we're still um, in the same situation with the move-ins that hasn't changed we haven't gotten any more which is good um, but it does look like we'll be uh, asking to access the special education stabilization fund uh, which we can do up to one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars leaving right now a gap of one hundred seventy five thousand that we'll have to continue to to work on <laughs> that was my question. Yeah, <laughs> as we always, <laughs> as we always do. Um, there's opportunities that we've taken in the past. Last year, we did not access um, food services for a new attendant. Uh, that's something we'll probably do. That's about forty-five thousand um, dollars. There's some indirect costs that we are able to charge to uh, community programs for the use of our facilities. Um, and then there's always unused funds um, in accounts. Uh, so uh, right now, if nothing changes, I would be confident that we could make that number. Good. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, first discussion of our budget directives for uh, FY21, not 20. Well, this uh, these are for these from last year. Is these are just it? last year's. Okay. Um, typically, either been included in last year, but we're including them now for the coming year to show where we are now. Yeah. Um, slightly different, but we also took them down further. Yeah. And then now we're going to have to go through that to find out. So the first thing that before we obviously we're not going to vote on these tonight. Um, can we get that breakdown of how many kids are actually in each elementary school class right now? Yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, we were using that percentage over. I think what skewed that is you throw one kid over, um, and it can really skew that number, and it's, it's one student. Yeah, but do we have the actual hard numbers now? Sure. So if we look at the most, um, we, we certainly have the numbers that we have in schools now, which I think put us about five classes or six classes at the elementary over uh, in different grade levels. But the latest numbers that are officially certified be DESE, which um, 
you know, we showed you last week in the middle school and you know, Deb was able to pull for us. Is it K to two? Um, and uh, excuse me, um, we have made over the period of time uh, up until those ro most recent numbers by the state, we've decreased from 23.7 to 20.9 with the elementary level, which is falling within um, these guidelines, both K to two and A to five. And so that's a decrease of about 2.8%. And I think it's probably this year, um, and we just did the October one enrollment, so we can certainly bring that back. Um, I, I think uh, maybe I'm, I'm yeah. I'm I, I, each school, each classroom, I heard, I mean, I, I wanna be clear that, you know, again, I, don't, I, want, I want to see the numbers, but yeah, I've heard that there are some classes that have 28, 29 kids in them, which I, I didn't believe, but I heard it, but I wanna see, those numbers to, you know, direct our our uh, our goal here. Yeah, yeah. 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 And we, we, and I know we usually have that as a presentation, but for our next meeting on the fifth, I and we just no, not for every single classroom. Yeah, yeah but I, class. no, no, no. I, I know we saw the one with the with the grade where it kind of goes down, but didn't we see the other one where it said I'm going to make it up like kindred third grade? We had two, and the average was uh, it was. Uh, we did. We saw it last year. We saw it last year. Yeah. Time's fly by. Okay. So, so right. we can easily get it. And what I would say is, I do know I, right now, based on um, the the numbers that haven't been certified yet by Desi, but the October one, you know, it looks like in K we're around. Uh, I think it's like nineteen point nine or twenty, um, maybe a little bit over now with, since the October one. But it looks like there was one class over in grade one, uh, and that was a Kittredge one. Uh, two classes over in grade two with Kittredge and Sergeant, and then in fifth grade. That's where you may have heard something. It was the fifth grade at the Atkinson and the Sargent. And uh, Miss Marks deals with this on a regular basis. It certainly wasn't 28. It was probably like uh, 26. Yeah, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm sorry, just cut you off. But I just want to see the number. And we can yep. have a discussion when we have the numbers. I think that would be a better way to do it. Uh, that's all I'm Not saying. a problem. Yeah. When I said we have five kids in middle school. Yeah. By classroom. I thought we by, by, by classroom. Right. Well, that was, so I think, that was where a general. Yeah, and we have that too. Yeah, yeah, easy to break down. And we'll discuss that on on the fifth. That's that was my m one of the things I wanted to focus mm -hmm. on. I, I'm sorry if there's other things you want to talk about with these directives. Well, obviously the, these directives are gonna. These are last year. These are these are last year, so we don't we don't need to reinvent the wheel, obviously. Um, but these are going to guide our decisions when we vote on, well, w when Dr. Gilligan and Seen's putting together the budget, obviously. For me personally, uh, you know, we, we've been focused on class size for a long time. It's been one of the things I've been focused on. I know I like to have those numbers before I <laughs> vote on these types of things. Absolutely. And the, just the process in the past is we've, the last, I think, four or five years, we've brought what we had the year before. Mm -hmm. And certainly, um, yeah. I, I think maybe one of them can drop off and it's really clear. Yeah. Um, and uh, are we down to 7.5%? So we would have to double check. That was kind of the one of the things that we wanted to get close to. Or it was like an effective zero. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm really interested in, in actually quantifying like where were we in terms of class average, not only at each school, but across the grade level to try to look at then how do we get to the state average? Because the percentage over, we can certainly provide you, but it's not. I don't think it's as accurate as saying what the actual average is at each grade level um, and setting possibly a target there. So I think when we said 7.5, it's because there's almost no possible right. way to meet it. Correct. Um, but if we said it, whatever it was, 12%, like we knew that was already going to be a pain. So mm -hmm. it was to continue to push you mm -hmm. and to continue to, to make it known with the Board of Selectmen and right. probably at the time Andrew Mailer. Um, that, that that's the goal, that's the directive, right? To, to continue well, to reduce that. So I, I don't think we've hit 7.5. I, I want to, I, I just want to jump in. Well, I want to jump in to say, I think when we're setting goals, I think that's important. Like those are aspirational to a certain extent. But this document to me is like, we're directing the superintendent to create a budget that's going to meet, that mm -hmm. is going to meet this. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe it's a larger number than the town manager or the finance committee want to give us, but we need to tell 
Greg, this is important. Th these are our goals. Uh, these aren't our goals. These are directives. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I, I know it's suddenly semantics, but if we're going to say to people that class size is 3 to 5, 23 to 25, nothing's going to be over 28. And I have a kid. I don't care if, if there's a kid, one kid over. You didn't meet, you didn't meet our directive. So I want to I want to talk like, like in those very direct terms about if you need more money f to make sure that doesn't happen, what is that that number? So we can provide you the common average for each grade in school. And one of the things we talked about was deep six and that percentage thing. Um, but we can, it, it's not hard for us to put together for the next meeting uh, to say exactly where we were. Um, and more importantly, I'm just going to say this. Uh, I handled out a neighborhood placement as assistant superintendent. We maxed out several 28s. 28 was the max. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not hit 28 this year. Uh, we have not closed out a class because we've hit 28 in any grade level. We have worked to move some kids because they were going to a district and the standard was, oh boy, they're higher, but they're not at what we used to cap kids out at. And there's room at another school that's smaller. So that's pretty, I mean, I think that's really significant to note. Um, and I think as we move forward, particularly with facilities, master plan two and all those things, we can get you the actuals from today uh, and like I said, I think it's a minus 2.8 with the official state data, um, which is really huge for North of Mandeville. Going off of what Chair Teresi said, when we have a directive that says do this, it means we want this prioritized over anything else. So in order to have classrooms that don't have more than 28 students, you might need to cut someplace else like EL or something else that you have as a goal. Um, so I think we we need to be very realistic when we set our directives um, and be aspirational when we set our goals. Um, I, I feel like last year um, the, the chair and vice chair had a discussion um, with the superintendent and drafted some goals which we then discussed. So it seems to me at our next agenda setting meeting um, the three of us need to draft some goals which we can present to this committee next time. Is that is that what happened process-wise yeah, last year? Uh, so you're reading my mind. Last time. And I like to do that. that. We're, like a, we're like a week off the here crystal because ball. of the schedule of this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that this is what we had last year. So we take a look. We're, that's what we've done for several years. We look at this. Then we'll get together after this discussion. Last year this discussion took place, I believe, in the senior center. Yes. Uh, very cozy. Yeah. And people had the same yeah. discussion. Is this an aspirational goal or is this a directive? The one thing that I think I cautioned then is, you know, um, that we also have a very a timeline that's well oiled. No one works this budget better than Jim Neely. That we meet with our leadership team that determines what are the critical needs. And you know, like last year it was a school nurse, or it was, or we wanted to add AP at, at the high school. At the same time, I hear what Chair Teresi is saying. Like, okay, so you know, let's just say for example we had an increase like last year of 3.75. I think, um, you know, we've had a consensus. Yeah, yeah, we've had a consensus budget for a, a very long time. Uh, and that, you know, that may have been higher, but the town worked with us to add the pay for the special education program at the Thompson specifically, um, but the, with the asterisk. That said, you know, we can certainly look at what something looks like at, you know, just for example, 3.5, 3.75. 3.85 and what are those needs but some of that too um, will be determined based on our process with our leadership team of exactly what those needs are and then bringing them to you to present like what are those priorities because I think particularly the class size one last year was really clear like cool let's set this hopefully we can get there because we were trending in the right direction we went from like 16.9 and we we were able to plan to get down to about 12 or 11 point in 11 and change. But it, people knew that like that would require everything to go to the classes at elementary. And if you recall, like we've backfilled eight of those 15 or nine of those 15 positions that were freed up. And the additional spaces were also repurposed into appropriate spaces um, for EL special education and all those things have to be taken into consideration. But So I was. I thought that maybe during this time, are we supposed to be? If we have any ideas, are we supposed to share them now? Or, or share them. Okay. Initial discussion. Okay. 
so a couple of years ago when we were preparing for the Ann Bradstreet, we needed to squirrel away money to add teachers a little bit at a time, but then we spent it on other things in the interim, like on one-off purchases, right? I think we used curriculum or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, we're beginning to look at how we're going to deal with some of the space issues at the middle school. We need, we need physical space, but we also are going to need bodies, and it's going to take time to add. Is this the right time to start looking at the dual purpose of squirreling away, adding one or two people at a time for future need, and then but spending the money on some of the other needs that we identify as one-offs so that we don't suddenly work toward some short-term interim changes while we make changes to the middle school, but then, oh, that's a great idea, but we don't have the money for a body. So I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying, but that's, I wanted to put that out there. So, so I think part of the plan with that was, you know, we knew that we couldn't add in one fiscal year, let's say, 10 people, right? right? I mean, that's just way too big of a hit for right. us to take. And so I think what we did for maybe two or three years is we, we kind of put in two positions um, for the budget so that when we got a level, w when we got an increment, it right. was already kind of built in there, right. and, and so we utilized the funds to do things like yeah. curriculum and things I like that. I would like us to start doing that now with the middle school, if, if, it's, yeah. if it's at all feasible. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say it's a possibility to do it that way again, but one of the things we're doing differently this year is coming forward with not just next year's budget proposal, but more of a five-year plan. Mm -hmm. oh, anticipating the renovations to the elementary school and added classes sure. as well as the middle school. So the, the long-term plan includes annual additions of mm -hmm. teaching teachers. Okay, I, I think, but I think this is the time to start putting something out there. Um, so we're discussing it and actually working toward it. Yeah, and I, I think I th I'd agree, and I think really importantly, it's also important to note, like, We've had a significant change in the leadership of special education who's doing an entry plan reviewing all of those components and significant turnover and some of the school level things based things and so we have to look at that we have to take a look at you know um, the special education program specifically at the Brad Street and what does that look like for programs um, you know as it is a, it used to just be pre-k and now we'll be looking uh, to service more kids in, in one model or one particular program or more things but I do agree, um, and on December 5th, I think what will be helpful is in the strategic plan, we realize um, that it's not everything's gonna happen overnight. So much like the five-year curriculum plan, um, looking at something that we've been discussing over the years, presenting like when, when we went to FinCom, uh, we may not know exactly what the specific need is in 2021 um, for an FTE, whether that's a counselor or a specific science teacher, but we are going to be looking at ways that we can have a five-year plan um, to try to best serve kids over time that's fiscally responsible, sustainable, and um, you know helps us improve so that we can meet these programmatic needs. And also create strategies to implement when we do find more space in some way. Good point. Thank you, Dave. And I was just going to ask you a question. In terms of per pupil spending, what, you say? what number are we in the state? What percentage number? So I thought I heard it mentioned tonight, but I just want to. So there's a couple things. You know, when Mias came in, they said we're in the six percentile. Yep. Um, you know, over the, over the few years, we've been, uh, you know, somewhere between, depending on how you look at it. So you can look at it as the state puts it together and puts it on their website with the DART. Uh, which much like compare schools as districts. So you can look at what we actually spend for kids that are in district, and that's one particular number, and then you have an overall expenditure. Um, what I would say is we're roughly, just to be safe, is we're roughly about $4,000 behind the state average. Right. Um, so that would mean, you know, although we're at like 48.72, 48.06, you know, we're, we've roughly been under 5,000, you know, that's roughly about $20 million a year. That's different from the state average, you know. Um, so when you, you you look at that, um, and you know, go, you go back and look at time. You just look at so maybe like if you go all the way back to FY10, I think we were at eleven thousand three hundred and seventy-seven. Um, and as we get here now, Jim Jim's really good at this, and I defer to him. But you know, Jim is right. It's around twelve thousand. We're a little over, right? But the interesting part of the last ten years is that 
the gap between us and the state average has actually doubled over the last 10 years. So my point with that is, I mean, and, and I don't remember how long ago, I, I think it was maybe two or three years ago, we really looked at the number of students in some of our surrounding communities, and, and they were actually losing some students, but their, their level of spending was kind of staying the same, and so, th so the average was kind of helping them out, right? Yeah, it, so it was working in their favor. You're 100% right. We, uh, we, uh, we looked at that, and what we identified is, oh boy, yeah, like th th these guys are really gaining past us, although it looks like they're spending the same amount per pupil, they've had a decrease in enrollment by 400 or 300. So I, I think part of the challenge that I would have is, you know, we've had these level financial budgets, right? But academically, let's talk about a budget, right? And what do we need to serve our students and our communities? Um, and our community, um, you know, I heard that there's a new curriculum uh, at the eighth grade, for example, with civics, right? And computers are required for part of that, right? So the PTA, the PTAC, is funding that, right? I don't necessarily feel from a curriculum perspective that we should be asking the PTAC in order to pay for those. So if we're kind of, you know, let's just say $4,000 below the state budget, or, or state average, I should say, right? Ma we can't make that up in a year, right? But what incrementally can we be doing to correct the per pupil average? And, and does that mean we're asking for the town to not necessarily give us 3.75 and everybody's gonna play nice, but you know what? We're so far behind in what we're spending, we're asking our families to contribute time and time again, and, and maybe enough's enough. What I would say is this, that uh, we've had this discussion as a leadership team, uh, and when you'll see in the strategic plan, it is something that will be proposed with a date to say, hey, this is the plan that we've developed. Just like we're, look we're looking at the K to eight leadership structures, um, you know, we had said we'd do those a couple years ago, but we're looking now to phase that in over time with recommendations. Mm -hmm. At the same type of thing, we'll be looking at incrementally over time, what are some of the ideas we have um, to increase um, support financially um, that's sustainable and doable um, beyond just one year. Yeah. And so I think what you're saying is, back to Jim's point about a plan, and I can let him you know, talk a little more because we've been we're really talking about this working in as a leadership team. Um, it's one of those things. I would say we're very fortunate in North End, of, for example, in, in grades one through eight, we're at 1.3 kids to a device. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable because several years back, we couldn't cobble together a Chromebook, uh, a yeah, computer yeah. cart for, yeah. for one school, yeah. a full one. And what I would say is in North Andover, teachers always go the extra mile in terms of supporting kids. But more importantly, this community is amazingly supportive and has been when you say community, though, I mean... Parents. Pa absolutely. Yeah. Parents. Yep. Exactly. Right. As one, I know. And, um, and, and that's the challenge everywhere, you know, that, like, Hable's the first place around, I know, they just eliminated, they got pre-K and they've eliminated all three sports. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so there's fees. I mean, at least when you donate to your PTAC, you can deduct that from your taxes. Fees you can't deduct because they're attached to a specific child. So that's... In, a, in effect, an additional tax on people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and we also know that fewer students participate when there's an activity fee, when there's a sports fee. Even if we have the money to support that, the behavior of those students is to not participate. Um, so we know that's impacting student experience. Um, so I think we really ought to be, um, and, and my kids started in town when we didn't have all those fees. It's not impossible, we shouldn't be you know, increasing those fees all the time. One question I do have though, um, Dr. Mealy, is what goes into that dollar amount? What, you know, I mean, is that educators? Is that utilities? Is that? Um, so so and as best they can, it's, it's unique. Uh, it's almost unique in the fact that it's apples to apples. Um, they count everything. I wonder if Lenny locked the doors. Um, so yeah, it, they include everything, all um, all expenditures on. Is that the same way in Andover? Like, I mean, I know that you know at some point, like our sewer came out, and we're no longer that's no longer part of the school. Right, wherever it's coming from, it's counted, and 
So it's okay. It's, it's apples to apples for Thank all you. different. That's yep. for me. I just wanted to add, um, going back to what Andrew was um, asking, that, that the other part of the uh, five-year plan that we're putting forward is the leadership structure that Jilly was talking about, that um, effort we've had there, has morphed into um, identifying the needs at, you know, we had already done the high school, so at the elementary and the, and the middle school level, and we've categorized them as SEL, EL, student uh, learning, uh, teaching, evaluation, and, and performance, um, and created those categories and identified how we might be able to improve in each area, and those are going to be part of the five-year plan. We're going to be um, proposing um, what we think we need to meet all of those. I'm fully aware of, you know, how I, I believe that we're underfunded, but I, d I don't think spending in and of itself is a goal, and I want to make sure we're clear about that going forward, but I do think that, you know, how we're going to spend that money, we make the argument to the FinCom, the town meeting eventually, you know, we need to, that if we get the more money, that's, this is what we're going to spend it on, and, 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 and that specifically for my concern, the, 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 the class sizes need to be um, addressed. Yes, so what I would say back to that is I think that it's been really clear in North Andover that, um, you know, that th what you've said uh, is a concern. That said, I think that that's always a concern in, in a lot of places. I think what's good about North Andover is we have had a strate specific strategic plan, mm -hmm. and we have a five-year curriculum plan, and we have uh, things in that plan that some of those needs we identify on the shorter term and others on the longer term. And having a plan, it's easy to say to folks, this is where we're going, this is what we want to do, this is where we want to be, and these are, the, you know, these are the process outputs, this is ultimately like what we'd like to achieve. And I think you know, one of the things that uh, districts have always struggled with, you know, something like a five-year forecasting, something around a budget, is you know uh, how it doesn't always line up with the state schools, mm -hmm. all the different things. But I think in terms of us advocating and providing for what's best for kids in North Andover, we know that that will take time and it will need to be tied to our plan of all students, um, professional practice and, and, and curriculum, and that we want to do something in a sustainable way um, so that we don't add something and end up, what you see in a lot of communities, something's added and then it's not sustainable and it ends up getting cut. Well, you don't want to get to a point, uh, you know, where, you know, we've identified a need. I've seen over the years. I've been here 21 years. So you've identified a need, you focus on the need, and then all of a sudden, s you know, to get something, something else goes. Uh, and we've all seen that. Some of you have been on the board long enough. So I know this. Having a specific plan with our actions, just like the, the, the 1920 strategic plan, which will come with revisions, we'll bring to you on December 5th, they're really specific now, not only to that, but we have some ideas of, and some timelines around, you know, what will it look like over time mm -hmm. to uh, get to where we want to be with the strategic plan. Right, but I don't think we need more than six or seven months. That's my point, right? But That's my point, but yeah. But I, and thank you for that. You know, I just get tired of hearing we have the lowest, you know, one of the lowest in the state, right? Well, what if we actually had higher? Right? Like, what would that look like? And I think that that's where the five-year plan is, but I think that's where we need to be going. And, and I, I, I think that the one-year plan is fine, but like the strategic plan, we have to look at the, the multi-year plan and continue to go that way. Yeah, and, and the strategic plan, like last year, was just a bridge year. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a story to tell. Um, you know, when we have, we, we have a story to tell of where we want to get with our EL students story to tell where we want to get with L students and what does that look like. We have a story to tell about where we want to be with social emotional learning, with curriculum, with all those things. And I think that that's what's become really more clear in the community as opposed of, oh, we have these needs, um, you know, uh, and let's do this. It's really kind of laid out very clearly. You know, take the five-year curriculum plan, math year one, math year two, yeah. science rollout over time. And we realize not only is it n not possible to do all at once, just like something like curriculum, it's not possible to overload teachers all at once with four new curriculums at once because the work is so intense. I'll just add that, yeah, we just had a teacher from Selma where we had about 80 or 
very little we know. Of, um, are, are very sensitive to being sustainable. Um, and we've worked collaboratively with the town in, in doing so. Um, our focus is not just adding money. It's identifying what we truly believe it needs to be to meet the needs of our students. And we believe we won't even come close to the state average, but if we um, get what we think we need, we'll, ha we'll have it. We'll, we'll provide for our students without even coming close, but there is gonna be the need for um, yeah, some that. And then we're accomplishing, and, and you brought this point out, Julie. I mean, we're accomplishing some of our goals, but on, on the backs of, of parents. And not the thing that we should be doing, the whole model, model classroom thing. I mean, I don't, the, the general public doesn't know that the PTO is funded, you know, all this equipment that we're putting in, in the schools that are, y they can't function. Those classrooms can't function with, with, that, with all that stuff. So we need to tell that story. We need to tell it better. And we just need a, a budget that reflects, you know, all the costs that we're, we're gonna, we're gonna need. So, um, but as far as the numbers, we'll have those for December fifth, December fifth meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll get the classroom numbers okay. to you. And um, any other discussions in the director? It was just the initial one. It wasn't even a first reading. Just initial. <laughs> yeah, be more. It, it was more spacious than the senior plan. It was. It was. Okay. Um, nothing else. All right. Uh, next is public comment. Any public comment tonight? Carl, three minutes. Um, you don't think we should start this? Nope. Just started. The clock. The clock's ticking. You wasted eight seconds already. Yeah. Click on your name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, about class size. I didn't was wasn't aware of any presentation. Just go ahead, talk. It's nwe.org. It's a test site that the schools use. So it's go ahead, Carl. It's their web page. Um, uh, regarding class size, my son has a is in a 36 seat class that ha that sits for two periods, two and a half plus hours. Um, they didn't have a, a, a dedicated substitute. So apparently they were sharing a substitute with another classroom and the sub spent the entire time at the other classroom. That's, that's, that's the end of that for me. You can do with it as you please. Um, regarding um, MCAS scores, I found my own way to improve my children's MCAS scores. This is a first grade report, average math student and uh, we were working to improve math scores, so we went straight to Khan Academy at the end of, uh, of the school year by the next grade. Um, they were doing fifth and sixth grade level math. I tried to talk to the teacher. They weren't interested. I tried to talk to the principal. They weren't interested. I went to the school board, school committee, eight years ago and said the same thing. I talked to Hutch. Hutch didn't believe me. He said it's impossible. So um, I was hoping to have him pull up the graph that shows the score. The maximum score that high school kids get may max out at 250 on the MAP score. This is a student at the beginning of eighth grade hitting 274, not even on the graph well above the graph. It's now an eighth grade, uh, or I mean a 10th grade uh, pre-calculus A student. And if you wanna see the MCAS scores that go along with those grades, I got them right here. So anyway, if um, the parents were educated and told how to use um, Khan Academy properly, which takes very little effort, they could have equal uh, success. If the schools participated, the success could be monumental. And it's been proven, they've proved it, used, they did it in the whole state of Idaho, and just with minimal effort, they were able to uh, increase the learning by 1.8 times, nor or what was normally expected. So I think it's a free program that, that they should look at. Um, 
I've been told that, you know, we have to follow curriculum. Um, if you follow curriculum, you're never going to advance beyond the curriculum. You're never going to do any better than that curriculum. Um, and there's other, other problems that go along with it. Supposedly the five-year plan is supposed to update books and things like that. I think the newest books we have are over a decade old. And I'd be happy to bring those in and show you the copyrights if you want to see those. Yes, sir. Are you interested in hearing anything about it anymore? You are a minute over your time right okay. now, Carl, so thank you. I appreciate it. I Thanks. apologize. No worries. Okay. Anything from the board tonight? Nope. nope. Yeah, Good. Just that um, I actually should have mentioned some of these things when the principals were here, but um, I had a wonderful opportunity to go to three of our elementary schools this over the last Friday and last couple of days. Um, part of it was understanding our differences and part of it was the, um, the Veterans Day at Thompson and um, it just was fantastic to be with, with all the kids and, and I happen to be with two fourth grade classes, one at um, Atkinson and one at Franklin with understanding our differences and uh, the kids were amazing. It's always just a wonderful thing to, to uh, participate in and I hope that more people can come out and volunteer for having at least one experience with those programs. It's, it's just tremendous. And then the other thing I wanted to share is that um, I went to the girls' soccer banquet last night, which um, the way their format is, is the, um, you know, the coaches talk about each of the players, especially the seniors, and they get their letters and their achievements. Then there are awards. But the best part, this is the part I wanted to share, was that their tradition is that the, fresh, the sophomores and juniors on the varsity um, speak about one of the seniors. There's one student that speaks about one of the seniors. So there was 12 speeches given last night by sophomores and juniors. And when I tell you spectacular presentations, essays, whatever you want to call them, what they had to say about what these players had to do um, as an impact on their experience as a high school student, it just was amazing, and I just want to make sure that people knew that athletics is not just winning and losing on the field. It, this whole culture of, of being a teammate and also celebrating um, kids graduating it was really beautiful, and those sophomores and juniors were incredible. So I just wanted you all to know that. Yeah. Some of them had to have some respect about your daughter for coming yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> no, I no, mean, all, all, being all 12 of them we, were, were, we all know were Claudia crazy, just amazing. <laughs> So it but it's, it's nice to hear, especially when there's, there's been a story in the paper a lot about a, a couple of so high school soccer players being very disrespectful to some officials, and it's nice to hear that right. you know that this is much more than no, the norm that, right. the, with all due respect to our media friends, that but they our, portray. Our, our kids like they give present, they give oral presentations even in a setting like that. I mean, and incredibly well spoken. Yeah, it was beautiful. Co-curricular, good, good word, Helen. So I wanted to share that. Thank you for sharing that, Helen. Want to? <laughs> School Veterans Day. I also am doing two understanding our differences this um, this week, one at Kittridge and one at um, Atkinson. Um, and I would just give a shout out. Um, I did the hearing deficit or hearing loss, hard of hearing, um, deafness. Um, and I, I've been able to speak at a couple of those, and that's exciting for me. But um, at Kittridge, we had one of our high school students um, who has a cochlear implant speak. Um, and it's just so helpful, and it's the kids are so responsive to that. Um, so I, like Ms. Mabley, I would, I would encourage you all to get out and, and do that if you haven't already. I, th I think several of you have, so. Yeah. I think they came to Jamaica, my son's class. Last, was it last week, maybe? The week before? I forget when. Thursday or Friday. <sighs> anyway, so. Okay. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn, then. I move to adjourn uh, to the next meeting on December 5th, 2019. Second. Uh, motion made by Mr. McDevitt, second by Ms. Lynch. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Long meeting. Thank you.